Special City Commission meeting of the City of St. Pete Beach. Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024. It is 4 p.m. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, if you'll please do a roll call. Vice Mayor Lorenzen. Here. Commissioner Marriott. Here. Commissioner Filtz. Here. Commissioner Resnicki. Here. Mayor Petrilla. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, are there any changes to the agenda as proposed? Okay. Um, I will make uh, one change. Um, Fran had, sorry, not Fran, <laughs> Renee. I uh, had a couple, just one quick comment that she wanted to make before the audience comments. Um, if that's all right, can I get a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. City Clerk, if you'll please do a roll call. Commissioner Filtz? Yes. Commissioner Resnicki? Yes. Vice Mayor Lorenzen? Here. Commissioner Marriott? Yes. Mayor Petrilla? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, as you know, we're going to be doing public interviews tonight with candidates. I know you had one-on-one -on -one interviews with candidates yet yesterday. Can you hear me okay? Just a little closer. A little, just, yeah. Thank you. Um, we're having public interviews with uh, city manager candidates this evening, and we had one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews yesterday. Um, we're going to after we interview tonight, we're going to go into a debriefing session where we, we rank and rate candidates and see if we're going to come to a determination on who our top ranked candidates are. Um, one of the suggestions that I have is that um, perhaps instead of just reading them off as far as how you rank them and finding out who's our top candidate, I can actually assign a numeric value of these candidates based on how you place them in your ranking sheet. And we can look at the numbers. I'm a numbers person. We don't have to live by that. We don't have to die by that. Uh, it's not cement. We can change our minds. And um, I'm, uh, if you're so inclined, I'd be glad to even ask you to provide me your rankings from yesterday. And I can be telling that as we're going through the interviews. And that would be information that would be helpful, I think, when we get to uh, the latter part of this evening where you ha you will then rank them in the public interview setting. So if you're inclined to do that, Mayor, I'd, I just wanted to offer to do that. Okay. Um, so the suggestion is that we uh, <clears throat> provide Renee a, 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 the copy of our rankings from yesterday. That way she has them, independent of us seeing what each other's have come up with, she will then give us a tally that's going to be a blind tally without, if that's all right. Um, we can. If you all haven't already filled yours out from yesterday, maybe we take a few minutes uh, and then provide them right after audience comments. Oh. Okay. Mayor, can I just ask one question? Do all of these have your names on them? Mm. Not mine. No. They have to be identifiable. Okay. Okay. For public records. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we will provide those to you maybe right after you give us your final instructions. Okay. So in about. All right. City Clerk, do we have any audience comments? We do. Ken Heisel. If you please come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Ken Heisel, 2032 West Vina Del Mar Boulevard. St. Pete Beach, Florida. You have three minutes. Okay. Uh, I, this is an unusual uh, time for me to come up and speak because I've heard so much about uh, how bad everything is in the city, how bad all of you are and everything. I'd like to compliment you all for one, taking the job and two, for being here. Uh, and why I want to say that is because I have a picture that's on my phone 
This is a picture from Red, White, and Booze. I know you guys are being sued by Red, White, and Booze, but this is um, Tuesday night this week, and this is indicative of what we've endured for the last two years. This is a picture from our dock over about 500, 600 feet away, and it's a picture of a giant spotlight that he put on his property, and it shines in every house on South Vena, and then every uh, down along Pasco Way just lights up the wharf completely. Uh, that evening, we sent out a, a email uh, to the city commissioners, uh, or our commissioner, Rich Lorenzen, and then uh, city staff. And I think they're the most unsung heroes that I've ever dealt with. Uh, Jennifer McMahon sitting here, Pete Duar, Stephen Rivera, uh, Brandon Berry, uh, Kristen Coleman. Uh, my God, what they do for the city, they turned it into this in one day. I know it doesn't show, but the giant spotlight is gone. They went out there, they asked, asked them to turn it down. And why I came was because uh, I sat through the auditions for when you guys were interviewing, and you said something that you grew up here, you lived here, you wanted to raise your kids here, you wanted to die here. I had postcode envy from Gulfport from 1970 to 2010, and I finally made it out to the beach. And by God, I want to live here the rest of my life. I want my kids to live here the rest of life. But this is what we deal with, and I, but I want you to take away that's the bad side of it. But it's these people who work here that make it a true joy for being here. And I thank you all for doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's the only one I have. OK. Renee, you're up again. Renee. Thank you, Mayor. I am seriously trying to turn off my phone <laughs> again. Um, as you know, we're going to be interviewing candidates tonight for uh, a public interview session. Uh, all five candidates are excited to be here. Um, they had, a, 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 honestly, a, a great on-site visit. Um, they have had a chance to do a, a self-guided tour today. They had a chance to meet with all of you yesterday, uh, interact with the department directors. Last night there was a meet and greet, which honestly I thought was fantastic, a good turnout. I'm going to guess there was at least 75 people there, if not more. A lot of them coming in, going, but at all it, it was a really nice time to interact and a time to really get to know the folks that, that came, the community members and staff members and, and others. So. Um, we have, we're going to line them up over here in this room and bring them in one at a time. We have a schedule of about um, 30 minutes for each candidate. We may run a little bit over or a little bit less. It's just an ebb and flow, uh, but that is what we're anticipating. Um, we expect that you'll probably end up asking about, I don't know, five to seven questions, which is sufficient for a 30 minute time limit. Um, but that said, we're not going to hit a buzzer and, um, you know, it's not the gong show or anything. We're not going to run them out if, you know, when the time is up. We're going to make sure that, you know, we, we, we have what we need uh, as far as time is concerned. I would encourage you, like I'm trying to do myself, turn off alarms or anything that might just, you know, disrupt the process. I just, it's always a reminder to turn phones off and, um, and notifications. Um, the, uh, we're going to talk about the questions in just a minute. Um, but what we are going to do after the candidates are finished interviewing is we're going to have a debriefing session. And that's where we'll discuss the candidates further, determine if there is a will of the commission to move forward with a specific candidate or more than one or however we may land. We just really don't know what that's going to be. Um, but um, there, there's a lot of business to do at the end of these public interviews. We've got a lot of con things to talk about and walk through, uh, but we'll, we'll get through that. So uh, with that said, I would like to turn your attention to the questions. I actually sent you some sample questions for the um, public interview. I have copies of those if you need additional copies throughout. Um, and, and those are just suggested questions. I, th I think it's probably a good set of questions. I think we had a couple commissioners uh, that, that um, shared with me yesterday they would like to see an add-on uh, somewhere in those questions relative to community engagement. And I think that's very important, uh, certainly to this community, and it's worth having a discussion about with the candidates tonight. Um, so with that said, Mayor, I guess I really would kind of defer to you about how you would like this to start. Oftentimes, we'll just you know, everybody takes turns answer, asking questions. Um, we could start over here on my left uh, with Commissioner Marriott in the first question and then just circle around. Everyone takes turns asking a question. And then when the next candidate comes out, we could start with the next commissioner 
um, Commissioner Feltz for the first question. That way everybody's asking different questions throughout, if you understand what I mean. So that said, I'd like for us to look at the questions and come up with a, a good solid set that we would ask every single candidate, right? There's gonna be follow-up and clarification questions, of course, with each one, but I'd really like to have a good um, solid set of questions as we start. Yeah, I think what, what we talked about is, since we have a limited amount of time, there's yes. five of us, five of them, I think we could probably start off giving each one of them the opportunity just to do question one as an introduction, sort of, you know, who are you, what qualifies us, tell us about yourself. And then maybe from the remaining seven questions or so we can each pick one question and we consistently ask that same question to all the candidates so that we're asking the same question to all five at the same time we give them Brief time for introduction, and Commissioner Marriott starts with the first candidate, and we go this way on the second candidate. Nick will start, and then on the third candidate, Commissioner Riznicki will start, and we'll just go this way so that we're not always the same person asking the same question. Is that? Yeah. And, I've, and that way, we can ask one question and maybe leave a little bit of time for follow-up on that first question, almost like a debate style. I'll give them a couple minutes to answer the first one, quick follow-up to that question. But so that we can, so we have a consistent process so that every candidate gets the same five questions, an opportunity to answer those, so that we're not asking different questions of the different candidates. Okay. I don't know if that sounds Is that good? like a reasonable plan. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm understanding correctly, so for instance, first candidate, Commissioner Marriott, will ask question one. Well, question one will ask of everyone. Okay. Right? That's that's yeah. their introduction, right? right? Tell us about yourself. You know what qualifies you, what experience you bring to the table, right? Just as an introduction. And then we'll go from, from that point, question two, three, four, five, six, or if you all don't like question five, we can skip question five and use eight instead. So I don't know if you look at on the questions, if there's any particular questions you really prefer, and then that could be your question that we assign to you. I, so. I would like to do that, because that, that way we know what, which one. Sure, which, you know, right, so, so we'll start. Some, Commissioner we could just say the numbers. You know, yeah, which number question. would you like? Uh, <clears throat> Oh, I, I don't care which one I ask, but I think I think question number seven is a very important one. So I think we need to ask. That's yours. Seven. <laughs> In that case, <laughs> all right. Grab this. All right. So that's district one number seven. And we we got to stick with these questions, or can we? We don't have to stick to these questions. Okay. We do have to stick to the questions being consistent across all five candidates. Okay. Right, so that we're not so, asking. Yeah, so a question I'd, I'd like to ask is um, describe a time in, in your work experience where you felt you've brought the community together. Sure. Okay. I think that, that dovetails really nicely with number question, two. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to ask number two. I'm just okay. saying that yeah, yeah. that actually takes like care added. of number two anyway. So. Yeah, added to it. Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner Rizniki, any favorites? My favorite was taken, but. <laughs> 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 um, the f number four. Okay. And Commissioner Lorenton. I'll take uh, number eight, if that's all right. Okay. And then I'll take number three. Okay. Can I, um, one second, sure. can I switch to four to five just because I think four and three kind of relate to each other, depending? Sure, absolutely. So you're taking five now? Yes, Got it. just because they could feed to each other. Mm -hmm. so scratch yeah, we can kind of use like four as a follow-up to three if we want to. Exactly. Just to, you know, help clarify or mm -hmm. expand. So we're each asking the same question each time to each Yeah, we'll just start the sequence in which Understood. we ask the question, Understood. but you're, you have your question, yeah. that'll be your question to ask. I think that'll keep it the most consistent. Okay, and, and Mayor, just to clarify one last time, that first one is- Yeah, so when they the when they come up, I'll basically. say, you know, okay. I'll, I'll read question okay. one and say, can you just, by means of I'm introduction, sure can you please? Okay. okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excellent. With that said, I'm going to bring in our first candidate, uh, Mr. Glenn Adams, and um, they, did, they have not received the questions. They do not know the questions ahead of time or anything like that. Perfect. 
Mayor, just for clarification, are we, we've already, most of us already filled out the one-on-ones. Are we also using oh, yeah. this for the... I think just one, Renee, would you like the ones from yesterday? I would. Yeah, and then we're also using the one for tonight, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, could, could I maybe get the we can do a tonight? recess could after the point interview point? questions are done. Take 15 minutes, and then Renee can tally all the. And we want our name on this. Correct. Right. Please. Thank you. Okay. That's fine. Sure. Hello. Good afternoon. If you'll please state your name for the record. My name is Glenn T. Adams. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Um, we will be asking you um, five questions. Uh, each one of us has prepared one question to ask uh, with potential follow-up to that question. Um, but to start us off, I would like uh, if you could just take a few minutes to just introduce yourself and briefly explain from your perspective how your background uh, prepares you for this position. Uh, first off, I want to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, it's, it's a really an amazing opportunity for me as I, my wife and I have spent uh, the better part of the last few days since sun, Sunday looking at this community and we've fallen in love with the people here. There's huge issues, but the people here are amazing and so we really enjoyed that. So I appreciate this opportunity. So um, I will try to back this up and try to go as fast as I can through it. 1994, I was brand new to Savannah, Georgia, and uh, a good friend of mine was an alderman in the uh, Savannah uh, City Council. And he was telling me about city councils and everything like that. And we got side swiped by a, a hurricane. And what I mean by that is we had a hurricane that was downgraded to a level zero, so it became a tropical storm but we had a huge rain event and a lot of flooding occurred and uh, the city administrator did a fantastic job of getting everything back to normal in such a fast way that the weekend was back to normal. And I was sitting there going, that's something I wanna do. And so in the back of my head, I kept that in the back, trying to find a way to get to that point. I had uh, quite a bit of time as an engineer and you know you you do things like in Hawaii there was Hurricane Aniki that hit and you could help the community there um, it changed the laws that allowed installations to actually help first and then ask for using funds later on and as you go through your life and start to see how you can make an impact on the community you start seeing the things that add up to being exactly what it takes to be a member of a city government and to serve. And those kind of things are, you know, when I was in uh, Iraq, we had 1,200 engineer soldiers rebuilding the infrastructure in Baghdad. We, uh, then I became a, a facilities branch chief in um, Japan, supporting 85 installations and 102,000 soldiers and sailors, airmen, Marines and their families. Uh, across 85 installations, doing over a billion dollars worth of host nation funded construction. After I retired from that, I, I went back, started my own business, and you know I, I got involved with city councils and would come in and say, hey, these are the things that you should be doing. And because I, I'm the kind of person that you don't have a problem if you don't have a solution, I'd give solutions. And so they asked me to be on the water and sewerage board. And so it's about being involved with things. And then I went out to White Sands Missile Range and became the chief of staff, which is really the equivalent of being a deputy county administrator because it's 400 square miles of installation. And the difference on that is, is the businesses, you're accountable for their success too when you're on installation. So not only do you have to provide all the services, you have to make sure the businesses there ha are successful at doing their job. So it's one step up. And then I was fortunate to become the, the city manager of Santa Fe, Texas. Um, did some amazing things, reworked uh, water problems, fixed routine flooding, um, created quite a coalition to do that. And I, I really got the bug to be a, a member of a community and, and help it get to an excellence point. Um, regrettably, that 
that community didn't want change anymore. And so I was the face of change and you can't stop change once you start it. Uh, but they are taking credit for a lot of things that we started when, when we were there. And so that was very enjoyable. So you can see how this moves on. And then I tried to retire again. I, I really am lousy at retiring. So was my dad, he worked until he passed away. Um, I will tell you I'm very much the same way. And so I became a interim city manager for Percival, Virginia. They had a whole bunch of problems I'm sure you can read about. A lot of people have read about it and I will tell you it's, it's about my personal pride managing to um, save my integrity that I refuse to continue on in that position. Uh, pre previous interim manager did uh, quit in the middle of a meeting. I gave them my two weeks notice and allowed them have an opportunity to, to find somebody else to be in the interim. And so then I left and because of my actions there, the Berkeley Group hired me to be the city manager of Martinsville, Virginia as an interim basis while we recruited for a, a full city manager. So I did it as fast as I can. I drive, I'm at this point where I have the experience, I have the background. 85% of my professional experiences is not in my resume because it doesn't translate to a, in a way that most people would understand it. So I just kind of glossed over it. And so there's a lot of things as being an army engineer that back up to and reinforce the skills that are required of a city manager. So that answers the background and how I ended up here. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Marriott. Sure. So. This is this is a, a a a big question, but in uh, you know five to seven minutes, <laughs> um, what do you think are the biggest opportunities and challenges here in St. Pete Beach, both immediately and then planning for the future? So I would like to focus on the opportunities first. Um, as I mentioned, the people here are fantastic. They're very friendly. Um, there's a different vibe whenever you go out and talk to people, and the the background of that is everybody wishes they moved here sooner. But they also tell you about a time when they knew somebody who did something who was a neighbor. And this neighbor owned this organization and they would put on events for the community, etc. cetera. Um, I think an opportunity for us is to re-invite our citizens to be part of the community's future and invite them to participate much like you all have stood up and said, I will do it between de uh, December and January. But asking your neighbors in the community to reach out and help get us to the next phase because we have within our, our city people with the networks, with the resources, with the connections to help us get our get to a better position much faster than we can do individually. So that's the real opportunity. Um, I would say the weaknesses is we're not a community right now. Um, I would tell you that from just the conversations that I had last night, um, there's concerns that the, the development is taking a priority over the residents. Um, there's a bit of trust that was lost in the process for the Serata Hotel that I think can be fixed. Um, I can't guarantee it be fixed, but you, a method that I've talked to many of you all about is possibly getting an independent contractor to look at what they submitted, what our comprehensive plan is, and what our zoning ordinances are, and see if they mesh up. And if they don't mesh up, having that honest conversation with whoever should make those concessions to fix. Um, but I will tell you that there's more than just that. You have sea level rise, you have uh, king tides, and we have low lands. And I went down to the Don Cesar area, and it, it, you, I don't have to say, I could show you the pictures that I took. I was, it's concerning. That's the same flooding that I saw in Santa Fe, Texas. But when you see it's coming from the bay, it's more difficult to sit there and go, well, this is not an easy fix. And so basically you have to do what New Orleans did. You put up something on the outside to protect from outside water. And then you got to have a series of pumps, drainage systems, and redundant power and pumps. Um, that's very expensive to do. And solving that equation is not something you can do overnight. Uh, but there's 
you got to create that coalition of people who can get that done and it's really a, a city county state federal government trying to find the solution between all of those um, but the backbone of everything here is the people and I haven't met anybody who doesn't love this community with all their heart and part of the passions of both directions that you, you see the arguing about is that they want this community to be successful and they don't feel it's getting there yet. So I, I hope that answered your question. I feel like it did. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, sir. Commissioner Feltz. All right. Hi, Glenn. Um, my question is, can you describe a time or an example uh, in your career that you've brought c your community together that you worked in? Absolutely. Um, I, I think Santa Fe, Texas is the best example of that. Uh, I arrived in Santa Fe in February of 2020, one month before COVID hit. And as COVID started occurring, I, I foresaw the need to communicate with the, the community, talk to the council, and I started doing daily updates called Santa Fe Live. And I went live every single day with the information I got from the state and county um, conference calls that were done multiple times through the day. And I went from in the city of 15,000 people to 46,000 followers in a matter of less than six months. And I had complaints to me that I was on at the same time as the President of the United States and they wanted to watch me live because I would answer their questions. And so I feel that was the first inroad to that. Then on May 15th, 2020, um, we had nine and a half inches of rain in an hour and a half, a real flooding condition. Um, I went out in my wife's Jeep, thank goodness she wasn't around when I took it. And we, I went around and looked at the community and I was flagged down to go to different places. And I was in somebody's backyard, knee deep in water, going, I don't know how to fix this, but we gotta find a way. That was Friday after 6 p.m. when the storm hit. And Monday by noon, I had our mayor I had our street department, I had the county um, commissioner who represented us, I had the county engineer, the drainage district all out there discussing it, and we came up with the solution of draining it just like a bathtub. And while we're doing that conversation, the mayor asked me why I don't have find a way to solve the routine flooding, and so we created a coalition of two cities, uh, the county, the drainage district, and we cleaned drainage patterns all the way out to the Gulf, and we fixed routine flooding in the city of Santa Fe. So in about seven months time, I had pretty much unified a city that uh, never thought they would ever see a day that they wouldn't, wouldn't flood because of rain. And so they were the same people that were hit by Harvey and had 54 inches of water in the backyards and everybody has seen and heard that story, but now they don't flood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Resnicki. Okay. Hi, how are you? Um, what are your strategies for hiring, evaluating um, current staff, measuring their performance, and retaining employees, and managing the underperforming staff? That's a very big oh. multi-part question, so I'll start one at a time. So I stole my dad's legacy of hiring hard and leading easy. Um, I always create a panel of hiring agents and very rarely are they the majority from my organization. Uh, I set up a process, for example, in Santa Fe. They ended up not using it, but the logic is there, but this is how I do it. I find two people who are critical from within the org organization. Sometimes me, sometimes it's not me. Uh, then I go on to outside where they can best get some support. So I, I got a police chief, I got the uh, a sheriff's organization, and I'm, I'm having a constable's office. So I got members of all three of them in higher leadership. I did have the police chief from another city. And so when the selection process goes through, you create questions and you get the questions from all these different people. 
And then when they see the resume and they evaluate against the criteria that we create together, you will find the cream of the top ones rise up and there's a natural break point. And then when you do the questions in the interviewing, you now have a, a good diverse background of people who are selecting the top candidate to be the person who is representing us from that point on. The next part of that is, is once that police chief, police chief is hired, you have a sheriff, a constable, and a, a sister city police chief who are vested in the success of that individual. And therefore, you are able to have some backbone and support of people outside of your city being able to ensure the success of that individual you brought in. And so that's one way for hiring, and I've done it for whatever organization I'm doing. If I have public works, I have people from the, either the county or the state come in and be part of that same process, and I did that up in Martinsville. Um, so when you talk about the people, um, dealing with directors one-on-one, -on -one, I will tell you I'm constantly making an assessment. I believe in mentor training and developing people. I, I mentioned to a couple of you guys that there's an old saying in the military, you go to the war with the people you have, not the people you wish you have. So make sure you train the people you have to be the people you wished you could have. So I make sure I take the time and mentor train and develop my team. And how that comes across is I have a counseling session, it's tough for me. Every month with every single one of my direct reports until I'm comfortable with them and they're comfortable with me and my role. And why do I say it that way is because in my counseling I require them to come back to me with how I'm failing them. So I am holding myself responsible for those same actions that I need to do to make sure they're successful. At the same time, I am holding them accountable for not only the job that's in paper, but we all know that all of our directors are doing things that aren't on paper, and we have that discussion over the first few ones, and we agree that this is your job. And then my responsibility is to make sure they're capable of doing it and have the resources to be successful at it. Their job is to do it with ethics and do the same job of mentor training their pe team to do the same stuff because I believe they're the experts. I don't need to do somebody else's job. They're hired to be the expert. If I don't have the expert, I send them to training as long as they're willing. If they're not willing, I don't need them. So that's that part. The part that you're, you're talking the next iteration is, is developing the bench underneath them. Um, that, that is a, a second and third order effect of how I mentor, train, and develop. I require them to do that same mentoring, training, and developing, but at the same time, I'm going out across the community, catching our team doing their jobs and having conversations with them and finding out, one, did I resource them right? Sometimes I didn't. Two, is there more intelligent ways to do things that we're not seeing? But three, are they getting the information? Are they getting the, the, the permission to kind of fail forward. You can make a mistake as long as you're doing it honestly, trying to do the right thing, and therefore you have the ability to bring bad news forward and not get punished because that's when you start getting things hidden. But as you do this, people get permission to do the right thing right then and there. They see something wrong, they either fix it or report it, and they create the, the organization that's teaming together. The next part of that is I hold a monthly, I mean weekly discussion with all the directors where they're all required to have the top three things they're working on. And as they become a team, they start saying, well, hey, while you're doing that, this, is, this person over here is a good person to talk to about helping you out on this. And by the way, I can help you with this project too, with doing this, this, this. And it, it creates that team and having that knowledge across it at the same time. Mind you, I'm talking a lot, but at the same time that I'm learning all, all of this, I will be providing information to you all so that you guys are abreast of all the same issues that I am because I'm not doing my job unless you guys are aware of the risks we're assuming and the risks therefore you are assuming because we are. So you can adjust things and I can make recommendations adjusting resources so that we, we fix the right thing. I think that answered your question, but a little longer than I, I'd hoped. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Lorenzen. 
Just to clarify, do I get the last question or you still have it? <laughs> I'll, I'll take the last one. So. Okay. <clears throat> Just wanted to make sure. Uh, well, good to see you again, Mr. Adams. Um, so bottom line, it's two questions. Uh, why are you interested in this position? Sir, please say that again. I'm sorry. Why I'm... are you interested in this position? Bottom line. Bottom line? <laughs> There's two parts to that bottom line, and you already know that because I've mentioned to you. I came here early to make sure it's a good fit. And this is such a beautiful community. The people here are fantastic. Um, they're passionate, but they're fantastic. They're, they got the heart to help this community. They want this community to be successful. The second part of it is I'm a bit of a, I can't retire. And I love and I, I'm the happiest when I'm helping a community be the best they can be. And I hate to use that army thing, but, is that's when I'm the happiest. And it's, I won't say it's just a passion, but it's, it's something more. Where you're there and just like I was out in the storm watching nine and a half inches of rain come down and I knew I needed to be out there to find out what's really going on in the community and that's when I got the answers. And so it, it is a passion that I have and you know, I, I told you the, the backdrop to that is, is I think ahead and we bought a house in Alabama that my, my kids were supposed to be going to Atlanta to have their jobs and they didn't. And now they've met significant others and they're going different places than they currently are. So my wife's side, a logic is let's go somewhere where they'll want to visit. And as I was doing that research, that's when I found out you all needed a city manager. My wife did the research and said, you know, this sounds like an amazing community. And here I am. Great, thank you. Uh, and the second question on that one is, uh, and I hate to ask this now because we have one more question coming, but is there anything you'd like to add or clarify um, that you haven't already covered? I know that's an open question. Um, I think the only thing that's got to be clarified is pro probably Percival, just in case people didn't understand that scenario and go read the papers now that I've told them to. I was asked to do stuff that violated ethics and violated Virginia Open Meetings Act. And I was required by the council and I had the, I made them do in writing much like I asked you all to do, hold me to a standard and set those conditions and so it's in writing what I was expected to do and I was expected to give a very candid weekly update to them. And so one of the uh, council members, when I, after I submitted my resignation, said thank you very much for writing those very informative weekly updates to which Freedom of Information Act was immediately done by every news agency in the greater DC area and it was found out that I was holding them accountable for the things that they should be held accountable for. Um, so. It, it became a big ruckus, but I will tell you, it's because I was honest, truthful, and held the line on what the, the standards are that I was hired by the Berkeley Group and was able to help Martinsville like I did when I did. Yep. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Can you describe your ideal relationship between the city manager and the commission and the commission and city staff? Sir, I want to thank you for that. That was like a softball lob for me. Um, after the Percival thing, the city council there, it was very difficult for me to have trust. And when you all stepped forward in December and January, you didn't have to. You weren't going through the election process. You stood up and said, I'm going to support this city. And that's why I said I could be a, a member of this leadership and move forward on that because you're going to have the best interests of this community at heart first and I can work with that. Now the relationship, I'll be honest, it's got to be a team and I work for you all but I have to be able to inform you and keep you abreast of the risks and I have to be able to explain things in a way that you can make a decision between two very tough things as you start looking at all the budgetary requirements of what I described very briefly. That's the tip of the iceberg. 
because you guys provide the resources. So I need to be feel comfortable bringing bad news to you all and say, this is, I don't have the solution yet. This is the way we get the solution. And I don't know what the in-state resources are gonna be required to do it. And I'm also very active in participating in things. Um, so having a little bit of um, leeway granted to me in going out there and doing things for the right things, for the, for the right reasons for the community is, is really where I need some leeway in being able to do stuff. But I'm, I'm not gonna have any problem with any one of you saying, why'd you do this? Or I saw this going on down there, are you aware of it? Because I, I'm one person, I only have two eyes, and having you guys working as a team, therefore, and us working that way and understand we need to collaborate, we need to be honest with each other and show ex expectations, and having those discussions, you know, the equivalent of a comprehensive plan, but you have to have a strategic plan that gets you to each stage. stage. And being able to communicate so we can come up with a plan, not only to do this next budget cycle, but the couple after that, so we're funding in the right direction and we don't lose money by funding something that doesn't actually help us get to our vision. And so those are the things that I need. I need to have that, here's the standard that I, we expect of you for all of these things we want you to achieve over the next year, and we're gonna hold you accountable to that, and I will therefore be able to present that vision to not only the, the staff, but we helped pre present that. The staff, the directors are participating in this and influencing those thoughts. And so we're working truly as a team and you're representing the community and I, I'm telling you, if you wanted to have a, a town hall meeting, an open house meeting, anywhere, anytime, I'll be there because you've got to hear it from the citizens first, but I work for you. Thank you, sir. We've got a couple of minutes. Does anybody have any follow-up questions you would like to ask? Mr. Adams, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Lorenzen, would you be opposed to swapping questions with me? Because I think it makes more sense to end on. Read my mind. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody good? Yes, Next thank you. Next candidate is Kevin Cowper. Good afternoon, if you'll please state your name for the record. Certainly, uh, Kevin Cowper. Thank you, sir. Um, we're gonna give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, um, and then each of the commissioners will ask you uh, one question uh, with any possible follow-up. So as by means of introduction, um, you know, we've had an opportunity to take a look at your resume, um, but would you please take a few minutes to explain from your perspective how your background uh, makes you uniquely qualified for this position. Certainly, uh, and uh, thank you for this opportunity, and I've certainly enjoyed my visit uh, today and, and yesterday. Uh, so um, I uh, grew up in the Mobile, Alabama area and went to school there, went to graduate school at the University of Memphis and have spent a career working in uh, Alabama and Florida. Uh, I've uh, worked uh, in uh, coastal Alabama, in Baldwin County, the location of Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, Fort Morgan, those kind of places. Uh, I worked uh, for a number of years in Pensacola, Florida as community development director there. Uh, worked extensively uh, in uh, redevelopment uh, in that community. Uh, unfortunately, spent a lot of time on hurricane recovery efforts as, as well when, when I was there. Uh, from Pensacola, I went to Auburn, Alabama, home of Auburn University, and uh, spent about 12 years in that community as assistant city manager and chief operating officer. Uh, the college communities have uh, 
have their own uh, unique um, uh, um, circumstances, uh, not unlike uh, coastal areas that experience a lot of visitors and certainly uh, enjoyed my time there. Uh, worked extensively again on uh, redevelopment opportunities, downtown redevelopment uh, in, in particular. Uh, I have been in Dothan, Alabama now for five years. Uh, Dothan is a, a, a large metro area, uh, about 75,000 people in the city limits, uh, uh, double that uh, within a 15 minute drive, triple that within a 30 minute drive. Uh, it is a uh, commercial and medical hub uh, as well as a, uh, a military base uh, 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 right outside of the city limits. And uh, in Dothan, I've worked extensively uh, again on uh, redevelopment issues, uh, both downtown, uh, commercial corridor redevelopment, and uh, neighborhood redevelopment as, as well. Uh, as part of my uh, uh, program in Dothan, I introduced what we termed the Love Dothan uh, Community Development Program, and uh, be happy to talk extensively about that, but we don't have enough time today, but uh, that program uh, galvanized the community uh, 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 in support of, uh, of uh, future development and um, redevelopment and uh, particularly neighborhood preservation and redevelopment. Um, so um, again, my background is in planning. Uh, I spent 20 years doing planning. Uh, I spent uh, 30 years uh, in in local government, uh, in city management and city planning combined. And so I think that uh, combination of management and planning expertise is what uniquely qualifies me for this position. Uh, and in particular, uh, not only city planning, but I have extensive development in planning in coastal communities and, uh, and uh, redevelopment in coastal communities and, and otherwise. I have uh, dealt with very large scale development very, uh, very successfully through the years and I've successfully uh, brought redevelopment opportunities uh, to uh, various downtowns that I've worked. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Fields. Hi, Kevin. Um, sir. So my question, I think you kind of just alluded to, to it a little bit, but um, describe a time or example in your career that you've brought your community together, um, that you worked in, the community that you worked in. Uh, happily, that, that's a, a, a great question, and I will go back to uh, the Love Dothan program uh, in, uh, in Dothan, Alabama. So. Uh, as I spent uh, my first few months in, in Dothan, what struck me uh, when I was talking to people all from all walks of life, elected officials, uh, neighborhood residents, uh, most people would, uh, in some form in the conversation, say, I really do love, all, uh, really do love Dothan. I, I love being here. This is a great community. I, I love it. And uh, as I began uh, to put together uh, a, a strategy of, of thoughts uh, for the, uh, the city commission based on my first few months there. Uh, this theme of Love Dothan just kept coming up and coming up. And so I began to read comprehensive plans, strategic plans, other documents that were put together, and uh, basically was able to synthesize uh, all of that information into a Love Dothan program, which uh, addresses uh, downtown redevelopment, commercial redevelopment, business and economic development, neighborhood development, neighborhood organization and communication, uh, organization of the city and uh, the, the customer service uh, strategies for city employees mm -hmm. and uh, schools and infrastructure development and uh, uh, um, growth management. And so a lot of that stuff isn't particularly sexy, uh, but uh, we created a program. We launched the program uh, in a big way. We had several uh, hundred people in the auditorium when we launched the program, and the community uh, uh, just very much uh, galvanized around the idea of Love Dothan. 
And uh, if you drive there today, you'll see billboards that the billboard companies put up with Love Dothan. You'll see murals painted on the side of buildings. You'll see marquee signs that display the logo. You'll see baseball caps and T-shirts. And uh, it's just a great way to bring the community to, together. And we would show up as a city staff with, uh, with community volunteers from all walks of life and go to a neighborhood and spend half a day in the neighborhood cleaning up and fixing up and just working to help better the community. And uh, that program in particular, the cleanup program, uh, was just a fabulous way to connect the city uh, to the neighborhood and to the residents of, for them to really see uh, that people do care and do want to better the, the community. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Commissioner Resnicki. Hi. Um, what are your strategies for hiring, evaluating current staff, measuring their performance, retaining the employees, and also dealing with uh, managing under underperforming staff? Uh, certainly. So I'm a believer in the high-performing organization model. I think I had some opportunity to talk to each of you about that yesterday. Uh, that strategy um, is a strategy to empower uh, employees at all levels uh, to be creative and be innovative and to do their job and do their job well. Uh, it also is a program of accountability. And so I will tell employees, I want you to love where you work. I want you to love coming to work each and every day, and I want you to be happy uh, in your work. And uh, I find that when it, morale is good and employees are happy, uh, that they perform well and they provide the best customer service possible. And in the end, that's what it's about, providing uh, excellent customer service. Uh, people pay for services and, and, and they certainly deserve the best quality services we can provide. And so I have uh, dealt with employees at, at all levels uh, and some very high performing employees, uh, others that have not been able to get, get on board so to speak, with the program. And, uh, you know, we have trained employees, uh, counseled employees, uh, done everything that, uh, that we can to motivate and make sure that everybody's given an opportunity. There are some that are not able to do that, and in those circumstances, it's usually better for them to find employment outside of, uh, of local government. So, um, you know, I do believe, uh, particularly with uh, my direct reports, uh, department heads and the like. Uh, there, there, there are business plans. Uh, I work on a business plan program annually that is attached to uh, the budget and to strategic planning documents, and uh, they are responsible for implementing uh, those business plans, and then they would be evaluated in terms of their success uh, in what in what they have accomplished that that year. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Lorenzen. Good evening, Mr. Cowper. Good evening. Uh, could you describe the ideal relationship between the city manager and the uh, commission, and then, in your view, the commission and the city staff? Well, certainly, I, uh, you know, I, I see uh, the relationship uh, between the city manager and the city commission as a partnership. Uh, the city manager uh, being the chief executive officer, uh, the commission being uh, a board of directors, so to speak, and uh, uh, providing direction, guidance, uh, strategic direction, and uh, providing that uh, to the city manager, and then the city manager uh, then being responsible for implementation of, uh, of that strategy. So. Um, for me, uh, the city manager would be involved in all the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, the um, relationship between the, um, the, the commission uh, and the staff, uh, in my view, should be one of, uh, one of respect in, in both ways. Um, you know, the, uh, under the city manager form of, of government, generally speaking, not appropriate for uh, elected officials to uh, give specific direction uh, to staff, particularly lower level staff, and uh, that would be better suited coming through the city city manager. Uh, my experience has been 
uh, that uh, certainly uh, with higher level staff, assistant managers, uh, department directors, uh, a lot of times there's no need to go th directly through the city manager there. It's probably more expeditious uh, uh, for, for some direct contact there, uh, provided that that's, that's done uh, uh, respectfully in, in a way that everybody uh, uh, knows about it. Certainly, I would want to know about it uh, only so that I could make sure that the request uh, in that case was being met. Thank you. Yes, sir. Commissioner Merritt. Sure. Hi. Hi. Um, what do you perceive to be the biggest opportunities and challenges facing the city of St. Pete Beach, both immediately and then a little bit down the road as well? Well, immediately, uh, I think you haven't, uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing a number of, of things uh, come up. Um, I think uh, there, there are some obvious um, issues and opportunities uh, in the community uh, surrounding uh, redevelopment and infrastructure uh, and um, communication. Uh, and I think um, at short term, uh, there needs to be uh, should be a, uh, a visioning type uh, effort, a strategic effort amongst uh, you as the elected officials uh, to provide some uh, specific vision and direction as to what you are looking for uh, on behalf of the community. And uh, that, um, that I think, uh, would go a long way in communication with the staff and, uh, and communication uh, with, with the community. I think that, in, in, in my recommendation, would be a very first step uh, for you all to come together and, and provide uh, that direction. Uh, uh, also, uh, you have a lot of redevelopment uh, in the immediate future and, and in, in, the, in the longer future. Uh, I, I think um, you need to make sure that you've got the right people in the right places to address redevelopment. Uh, if you are dealing with large-scale redevelopment, uh, then you need people in place that understand large-scale redevelopment and, uh, and, and how to handle that. And, uh, uh, and certainly, uh, I would bring a lot, lot of that, that expertise uh, uh, to the table. Uh, longer term, uh, I think you need to be uh, addressing uh, some infrastructure needs. Um, yeah, some of those are pretty obvious based on the weather today of, of what, what can happen. Um, and, and there are probably uh, other transportation infrastructure needs as well as underground infrastructure needs. Uh, those uh, can be addressed through uh, development of a capital plan. Uh, that can be, in my view, a five or six year capital plan uh, that would identify and pri prioritize and uh, fund capital um, projects and, and the priority, again, that would be your decision. Uh, that's part of the budgeting uh, process. Uh, I, I do also think that you need to do some very specific planning work. Uh, a lot of talk about the comprehensive plan. Uh, I think you probably need to be more specific in some of your planning and do some uh, corridor specific planning, some area specific planning, uh, I think would be, uh, would be, would be helpful. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and uh, a comprehensive plan document with a lot of policy statements in it uh, is difficult for a lot of people to envision. Uh, an area plan would give you the opportunity uh, to include drawings and pictures of, uh, of what it is that you want and what you envision for the future. And I'd certainly recommend uh, a document like that uh, to help people envision what the future would be like, uh, I would certainly recommend uh, those types of documents for you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, I will, I'll ask you two questions. Yes, sir. We'll start with the first one. Why are you interested in this particular position? Yes, sir. Um, so, um, as I said in, in, in the opening, I've spent a lot of time uh, in Florida and Alabama and on the coast. I don't live on the coast uh, today, but a um, little more than an hour away from it, so I certainly spend a lot of, lot of time there. 
and uh, it's certainly an environment uh, that 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 I enjoy. So I'm looking for a uh, career opportunity uh, in a community that has a high quality of life, and uh, you certainly uh, check that box for me. And I'm looking uh, for a community that could use my uh, experience and expertise. Uh, I want to be somewhere where I can be of value and where I can bring something to the community. And uh, I, I, again, I think you check the, the box for me in that regard. I think I can bring a lot to you. Thank you, sir. Commissioners, before I ask the final questions, do you have any follow-up questions on any of the previous questions? All right. Uh, so the last question is, is there anything else that you would like to add? Anything else that you would like to for us to know? Uh, well, I'll close out if that's okay. Um, and I appreciate uh, appreciate that that opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to come here and visit your wonderful community and spend spend time. I was hoping for a little beach time this morning, but it was a little <laughs> ugly out there, so that didn't quite work out for me. Um, you know, uh, again. Uh, you know, I've uh, 30 years of uh, experience in, in local government, uh, much of it in coastal areas, and uh, much of it uh, working specifically on infrastructure uh, planning, on strategic planning, uh, budgeting, organizational development, and most importantly, linking all of those things together to create a comprehensive strategy to move uh, whatever community I've been in forward. I've worked in uh, some uh, very uh, high quality places and I've seen uh, very uh, high quality development and, and redevelopment and I certainly know uh, how, to, how to handle that. So I appreciate uh, your time and, and your courtesy and uh, I <coughs> certainly have enjoyed the time that I've been here and I wish you the very best in your future, no matter who you select as your city manager. It is uh, a very important decision for you. You all know that, and, um, and I'm honored to, to be here uh, having the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Hopefully Thank you'll you. still be able to sneak in some beach time. Ah, sounds <laughs> great. Sunsets at 8 o'clock tonight. <laughs> is it okay if I shake hands with you? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the assistant city attorney. Nice to meet you as well. Jim ran away. He he said, "I'm out." <laughs> they might leave the door open. Oh, they can open it, right? Yeah, yeah they can. Jennifer's thing. back there. Oh. <clears throat> who's who's coming in next? Uh, Jim. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Jim Harriet, James Harriet. Thank you, Mr. Harriet. Um, we're going to start with a quick introduction, and then each of the commissioners will ask you one question um, with possible follow ups. Um, and we're asking everyone the same questions. So, um, just the first, by way of introduction, if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to just briefly explain from your perspective how your background um, makes you a good fit for this position. Sure. Um, well, 
Let me give you a little bit more history on, on me personally, because I think it all leads together. Um, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. I'm born in Dearborn, Michigan, and raised in, in what they call up there the downriver area of, of Detroit. Um, and when I was in my teens, my father moved us down to um, Fort Myers, Fort Myers, um, Cape Coral area. So we were down on the coast there. I graduated high school and went to the University of Florida to study engineering and ended up sticking around for a second degree in engineering. So I have a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in civil engineering with the, the emphasis in um, the bachelor's was on structures and um, hydraulics and, and water resources. Graduate school, I took on transportation and transportation planning, traffic operations. And that's really where my career centered. Um, I was hired as a traffic engineer in Sarasota County and gradually worked into the manager of transportation planning and took that up to transportation planning and transit and then took over the entire transportation department, all their capital projects, which led to taking over the county's entire capital improvement program. Horizontal, vertical, above ground, below ground, buildings, roads, sewer systems, stormwater systems, the works. We pulled it all in together under one group and um, led that, that group through about 100 to $150 million a year in capital improvements for a stretch of about six years. Um, it was a unique, unique experience um, to be able to do that. It also allowed me to work with the board a lot more. Um, I was the executive director of public works and capital management services. There were six executive directors that, that worked in um, Sarasota County reporting up to the county manager. So we were deeply involved in the operation of the government. In fact, our expectation as six executive directors was to understand each other's budgets and how they worked, what their issues were, what our concerns were, and collectively as a group of six, talk to the board, talk to the administration about how to get stuff done, how to respond to the pressures of the community, how to respond to the pressures of, of the budget issues. Um, and there were some, if you remember the downturn in the economy, we had a, we had a pretty good struggle and, and difficulty there. Um, then the opportunity to move up to Alachua County and I took on the deputy county manager position and was an integral part of all the different operations, although my specific area was infrastructure for obvious reasons um, and, and public works growth management and, and basically the built environment and, and the improvements to the built environment. Um, after seven years in Alachua County, I took on, uh, got a great offer and an opportunity to move over to the consulting side and became a civil engineer consultant. Um, so, you know, I had my PE through the entire time, but got to use it and, and work with municipalities and, and county governments mostly, but the state occasionally and the University of Florida occasionally, um, and basically worked on the, the infrastructure that those communities need and desire a lot in, in, in north central Florida, just into the Panhandle, a couple down into, into the, the maybe Orlando area, just north of Orlando, and a lot in Jacksonville. So that brings me to here. I've got a lot of ex experience the chance to come back to the coast, the chance to work on the problems of the coast that I was familiar with years ago. Um, it was just an opportunity I couldn't pass up and, and hopefully that experience can serve you well. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Resnicki. Okay. Hi, how are you? Um, what are your strategies for hiring, evaluating staff, um, current staff, measuring performance, retaining employees, or managing underperforming staff? Um, well, let me talk about hiring staff first, and then we'll, we'll kind of work through it. Um, I've worked for over 20 years supervising and hiring people from a very small department up through an organization, um, and has always used the same process or tried to educate staff that is doing the hiring, um, because I didn't hire every person. As an executive director of Public Works, for example, in Sarasota County, at one point I had 799 employees. Um, usually it was around 400. There's no way you can hire 400 people. It's hard enough to hire 10 um, to report to you. So my philosophy and my approach was to go through a simple little process before the position's ever advertised and you sit down and you figure out what that person is, what, what's that position to you, what's it to the organization, what's that person look like in terms of what is their character, how do they react, how do they do things. 
Um, what are you looking for? The first thing that falls into my priority anytime I walk into hiring somebody is, is kind of the personality, the culture, and their, their attitude and approach to things. Um, it, it smooths so many other things out. You can teach the technical parts. If they know the technical parts, that's great. But if they're, if they're just a bad character, how do you say that? Um, if they're just a bad character, you know where I'm coming from is they can be the smartest person in the room and nobody can stand to be around them. So you work with a culture, um, character, work that into the position, and then you ask and point questions once you advertise. You point questions to determine if they have that. It's very um, active-based questioning. You know, give me an example of a time when and be very specific about it because if you're hiring somebody to run a counter service at a library and they have to deal with, or a county counter service in a growth management situation, the experience they had from working at Publix or Chick-fil-A really applies. You know, what's an angry customer do? They're the same thing that, that's sitting in front of you at, at the city and you want the city re well represented through that process. Um, so that brings the person on board. You select the best candidate through that approach. Um, in terms of expectations, we worked on, on expectations and Sarasota County had them very clearly, very clearly lined out and we based those expectations based on the complaints you received from the community. So project management, for example, um, there's a whole bunch of things that going into making sure the project's on schedule, but the community always asked, when's the project going to be done? So we put a Everybody's got a date, you give me a date, we're gonna figure out a date to complete this project and then we're all gonna hold ourselves to it. So the project managers held to it, the administrative assistants held to it, the community services, um, the community outreach person that was on the team, the teams built around it, the legal department, the procurement department, they were all held to finishing that project on time, that feeds into the personnel evaluation. Um, obviously some things are missed sometimes, but once you lay all those out, um, everybody knows what's happening, they, knows what, they know what's expected. They're working on it as a team. Even mine, as the executive director of that department, I had those requirements. So when I did my evaluation with my supervisor, the administrator and deputy county administrator in Sarasota County, I was reporting on the same things the employees were reporting on to me. Um, discipline. Mistakes happen. They're real, we all make them, they all happen. They shouldn't be fatal. Staff shouldn't feel like they've, you know, they've lost their job over a mistake. There are critical mistakes that likely turn into, um, we'll say fireable offenses, but those are usually pretty black and white and they're pretty damaging in the process. If you make a mistake and you're remorseful over it and go, wow, I just didn't know, or I made a judgment call and it failed on me, you know, own up to it and we'll correct it. We'll, we'll talk it through and, and we'll move on to the next step, which is usually, you know, fixing that problem and moving on to the next one. I think it builds a culture of, of a solid foundation so people can think clearly. Government has that aspect of, you've got people out in the field all the time, all day today. I was driving around you know, down into Paso Grill and stuff like that, and they were, they were your workers out there. You want them to be free and comfortable to make a decision in the field that they feel is right and that they're gonna be backed by it. And if it's wrong, okay, we'll fix it and we'll move on to the next step. So, hope that answers that question. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Lorenzen? Yeah. Uh, good evening, Mr. Hart. Good to see you again. Um, can you describe your ideal relationship between the city manager and the commission and then the commission and the uh, staff, city staff? Um, and they are different, in my opinion. There's five of you that can't speak together outside of this room. And, and many times the public doesn't realize, realize that. So as the manager, I can't go through and poll, you know, oh, you're thinking this way and you're thinking this way and you're thinking this way. My um, job as the manager would be to look and make sure you all have the same information going forward. So if, if one of you goes to staff and says, hey, I need a piece of information, my expectation would be that staff provides it and four more copies for the, for the ones that didn't ask. Um, that's just pretty much a standard procedure. If one of you needs it, you all need it because you're a collective body. And that's how I look into that group. I would 
obviously would meet with you one-on-one -on -one at, at times and, and on a regular basis and talk about issues. And it would probably be a pretty, pretty frank discussion. But the moment that turns from one-to-one -one and it turns into a body, staff, myself and staff, should provide everything you need to make that decision. And when you make the decision, we move on to the next step. The manager doesn't have a vote. It's not a sixth commissioner up there. Um, the manager's there to carry out your directives, to carry out your policies. I may personally have an opinion one way or the other, but I've never let that opinion out or show on, on a public basis. And I think that's the message that gets carried down to staff. So once you set a policy, once you set a budget and a direction, that's how it's carried through staff and maintained through staff. And then we just keep working towards the, the objectives you have out there. And then part two, that was the commission toward your city staff, that relationship. Um, some commissions, some managers might come through and go, you know, I speak to staff, that is true. And for in terms of an org chart, you know, you have just a couple of employees, really. And then the manager has a group of employees, the staff. It's incredibly inefficient in government to say, everything's got to come through me. I've got to know everything. It's not going to work if that's the arrangement we set up. My recommendation would always be, you have open access to staff. You know who the public works person is. You saw the truck. You might have seen them out on the street. You give them a call and say, hey, I need help with something. That would then, my expectation of staff would be to convey that, convey that back up the ladder, make sure I know, because I don't want to walk into a meeting with you and, and not know something they know from talking to you. But I also don't want to close the door for your conversations with staff. If you've got a question, give them a call. If you've got a request, I would say run it through the manager, copy the manager, and there's a reason why. You and the public may not know this nuance. You individually can't direct staff. But if you have a request, and it's a request that any citizen in this city would ask, and we would go ahead and check, for example, hey, looks like there's a big pothole out on some street. Can you come out and check that? If you called staff, if you called somebody in public works to go out and do that, my expectation would they would do it, because they would do it for all 8,500 residents. You're a resident also. And that's the differentiation. If it was, hey, would you run this report or would you, you do this analysis of this? That might take some staff time. Run that through the manager's office. I'll get it down there. If it's a financial issue attached to it, in other words, if it's such a report that it takes hours to do, I might need to bring it back to the rest of you and say, we're gonna spend money on this to, to comply with this request. Um, do you have a problem with that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Merritt. Hi. Hi. Um, what do you perceive as the biggest opportunities and challenges facing the city of St. Pete Beach, both immediately and then a little bit down the road? I think your biggest opportunity immediately, um, or your biggest challenge immediately, is is the the redevelopment items that are going on. You've got to, I mean, within a few days, you're going to hear another another one come before you. Um, huge challenge because what came back out of the public meetings and the discussions was this kind of difference of opinion that's out there on, on how this is happening. Is it happening the way it should? Um, the biggest opportunity, well, let me back up, still on the challenge side, and I've said this to some of you, um, you we can choose as a community to redevelop and what that looks like. There may, just by geography and where we're at, there may be a point in time where it's chosen for you. Um, Fort Myers Beach was kind of a happy little sleepy fishing village type thing. It was a tourist destination to a certain extent. Um, I hung out there when I was a teenager. Um, it, it was what it was and they kind of said, we're gonna stay the same way and we're, we don't wanna change. We don't want anything to be different. We don't want high rises or anything. Nobody's talking about that now because none of it's there. I mean, it was a September a while back that all of it kind of got taken care of. And I'm sure that coming right out of the chute, right after the storm, there were people knocking on the door saying, what are we doing? What are we gonna do next? That's a challenge. On the flip side, you have a lot of interest in this community. That's a huge opportunity also, that redevelopment. There's a lot of people coming in wanting to do something in St. Pete Beach. Um, how do we do that? 
what's important to the community? How does the community look at all of that? It's easy to say never change, and I have to admit I've probably said it as, you know, a few times too. Um, but it happens. I mean, changes every second of every day, every minute, everything changes. So um, dealing with that, planning for that, I think it's many more. It's much more important to um, do it on your schedule, without the pressure of somebody, you know, pushing you through the process. The second big challenge you have is is water being in the wrong place. Um, I've washed my car from the bottom up today after the storm came through i made it a point to get out there and headed down to pass a grill and got to a couple points and went do i have a big enough vehicle to get through here um i visited some other streets where it was obvious that it looked like public works or somebody had been out there and kind of coned off areas that had flooded getting a tackle on that and the resiliency and with, with the seawater is, is high. I got to witness, I think I was talking, I got to witness out there, you know, the, the top of the seawall and the top of the ocean right below it. And I say ocean, you know, you know, seriously, because there's a lot of water coming in from behind that. Um, those are the two things that jump out, that redevelopment and, and dealing with that infrastructure. I wish I had a solution for you and could say, you know what, here's a book, page 52, 67, and 38 will solve all your problems. It's going to be a little bit more difficult than that. Thanks. So follow, would you be able to give us an example or two from your past experience and how you've dealt either with water intrusion or development? Sure. Um, one of the projects that my team did in, in St. Armand's Circle um, down in Sarasota County, um, St. Armand's is a bowl. It's low. Built by John Ringling, you can tell it was always that way because if you've ever been there, everything either ramps into the stores or steps up into the stores. Um, they had a serious problem with it. High tide. And this was before anybody started talking about these king tides and such. At high tide and a storm combined together, they couldn't get the water out of the bowl. It was in a, you know, this little saucer, the water couldn't get out. So we did a, a project where we moved the water to a holding place, let the tides drop a little bit, and then we pumped the water back out into the bay using duckbill baffles um, over the outfalls. So the, the baffles would close sit when the pumps kicked on those baffles would open up and push the water out and it was fine as long as we maintained positive pressure and then they would um you know you would drop the pumps off and the the um, baffles would close back up and hold the seawater out it was a solution for st armand's it worked um, a lot of math and engineering go into that you know where's the rise and fall how far out are you pumping it can you maintain the head pressure to get through the baffle all of that is a, is a factor, um, but quite frankly, it's just an engineering problem at that point. Um, that may be a solution that works. Um, I noticed some of the flooding areas in Passagrill look like a bowl, you know, and it, in, in um, Alachua County, we had some of that similar situation, very hilly country. The low areas were collecting water, and we knew if we got it over the top of the hill, it could drain into a sink or a, a natural waterway. So the solution there, very low cost, we hooked up automatic pumps and it just, the pumps kick on when the water comes up to a certain level and pumps the water to the other side of the hill and, and that's it. You run the pump line or the, the, the outfall line off the pump through the drainage system and, and um, just move the water that way. Very simple, very cost effective solution. Does it accomplish what you're looking for for every storm? Maybe not. Um, in Alachua County, some of the big major storms, those 100-year storms that you hear about, those aren't fixed by the pump, but the 50-year is and the 25-year is, those weren't fixed, those weren't a problem before. Um, I've also worked on some beach renourishment projects that kind of, you know, gave the beach back um, in, in um, Sarasota County. So I'll give you a few examples. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fields. Hi, Jim. Welcome back. <clears throat> um, my question is, could you describe a time or example in your career uh, that you've brought your community together? Um, in charge of capital management services, we had, we had several projects that went 
went through. One of them was was the redevelopment and, and kind of recreation and re-imaging of Siesta Beach, if you're, you're familiar with, with the beach down there. Beautiful beach is bounced around number one or number two in the world, probably competing with St. Pete Beach. So um, some people just didn't want it different. Other people's other, you know, other people wanted something brand new and something remarkable. There was always the pressure of the community. The beach was busy enough before we ever thought about doing anything with it. Um, why do it any better and allow more people, you know, provoke more interest in people to coming down? Um, it involved a lot of community meetings and a lot of discussion with the community of what the expectations were. Iteration after iteration after iteration, ironing things out. Um, that was one example, probably a smaller example. The larger example was in, um, also in Sarasota County, it was called the Sarasota 2050 plan. If you're familiar with Sarasota, you drive down the interstate, you look west towards the coast and it's all developed. You looked east and it's rural and largely undeveloped, at least it was back about 20 years ago. And that was by design. They have an urban service boundary and urban services are provided west of the interstate Rural was supposed to be east of the interstate, but there was a huge pr pressure to redo east of the interstate. Um, I worked on the transportation element of that, a lot of modeling of what this, if it were developed, what it would be and what it would do, um, but attended probably a meeting a week for two years, a public meeting and a public discussion. Pieces were pulled out and discussed with the community and, and consensus trying to, to work out was everybody happy at the end? Absolutely not. Um, was everybody angry at the end? Not so much. They, everybody was heard. It wasn't perfect. I doubt everybody, anybody thought it was perfect. The developers most certainly didn't think it was perfect. Um, I can tell you one of the things that came straight out of that plan was, was the, the preservation of the environmental lands in the county. And the developers through that process at the end, if they develop, they're required to dedicate that land to the county at the start. The moment they submit an application, all that environmental land becomes the county's. Um, and then you start talking about the pasture lands and what happens there. Um, it was a guiding document, comprehensive plan. Took about two years to um, work through, and that time was good. Um, it allowed a lot of people to talk. It allowed, a, it allowed the commission and the, and the community to say, hey, we, we're still not ready with that. We're, we don't like that part. Okay, let's have another meeting on it. it took patience from the development community too. They had to wait and, and kind of um, settle down as we went through that. So um, two examples. We were required to do public meetings on just about everything in road projects um, especially. Um, did a lot of road projects and my tactic on the road project was is kind of walk in with an aerial you can see graphically picture aerial of the of the um corridor but there were no lines on it and people would walk in going well yeah this is the street as it looks today what are you doing well what do you what would you like to see i know what i need to do from a transportation standpoint but what would you like to see and they would help design it and provide the feedback um, to the design team that we then issued to a, a design contract for um, to complete the design on it. We did have one corridor that was started out in in the 90s as a six lane corridor right through the heart of the community. Um, the community asked that it be changed to two four lanes, two lanes in each direction. And when we went through that public process, they talked more about walking and biking than traffic and it turned into a two-lane corridor. So that road is now one of the most popular walking corridors, a two-lane arterial that was originally planned and modeled to be six lanes. Nobody's suffering, the community moves around, it's one of the favorite corridors. And the final years I had in, in Sarasota, that when we would do another project, they would, everybody would point to that particular corridor and say, we want one like that. Um, so that was another way you know, we, we brought the community in and talked through it and, and made big adjustments to what we were doing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Why are you interested in this position in particular? The challenges that are out there, um, you know, by nature, I tend to be a, a 
a problem solver. I think it comes with an engineering degree or an engineering mindset. Um, you know, the coastal community, the issues that coastal communities are dealing with, um, and chance the chance to lead a, a nice size organization that that is um, tuned into those concerns. The fact that it's a beach community, it's just a special place, and it's and it's always a a pleasure and an honor to be involved in projects that are on the the beach side of the Gulf Coast. The North Gulf Coast in through the bend is all rocky and not much fun to swim in, but the southwest side of the coast is is beautiful and gorgeous, and it's just a great chance and a great opportunity to be be a part of that. Um, the stormwater issue is big. It's the same thing up and down the coast, um, but it would be it would sure be fun, to, you know, it would sure be fun to um, solve that problem. And why can't St. Pete Beach be the community that leads the state and says, hey, we figured this out and, and here's what we're doing. Um, that's a great opportunity. And then in conclusion, is there anything that you would like to add, anything else you would like to say or clarify? or? I don't think so. We've had a lot of discussions over a couple of days. Um, you know, it's everybody to a T. You know, I've been been through the chamber. I've quizzed people at the grocery store. I've been down here several times. Everybody to a T says it's a great community. It's really cool. It's really neat. It's really laid back. Um, that's exciting um, that everybody thinks that. Nobody has ever. Nobody has said you know, d careful about St. Pete Beach. That's not out there at all. Um, that's exciting. That's interesting. Um, it's it's been an honor and a pleasure to be able to come down and talk to you about it and, and be in front of you. So, I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. We appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Okay. Uh, re request a quick recess. <laughs> sure. Let's uh, let Renee know. Renee. We're going to take a quick recess mm -hmm. to 5.40. Thank you.
If you would please state your name for the record. Micah Maxwell. Are we going to get demonetized because of copyright infringement <laughs> <laughs> on our YouTube channel for the city? <laughs> All right, if you uh, please state your name for the record one more time. Yes, Micah Not Maxwell. Music. Thank you, Micah. Um, we're going to ask you um, the same five questions we've asked all the other candidates, um, but by way of introduction, if you can please take a few minutes just to kind of explain from your perspective how your background makes you a good candidate for this position. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, um, I've uh, kind of grown up in the business. My father was a city manager. Um, uh, went to un the University of Florida for my undergraduate degree, uh, USF for my master's, and, and then moved on to Bel Air. It was my first job. I was the assistant and then the assistant to actually reverse that um, in Bel Air for two years. And then uh, I got a job as the uh, uh, town manager uh, in year three. And uh, I was the town manager for about 11 years, city of uh, about 4,000 people and about, uh, about 75 full-time employees, about 100 total. Um, so a little smaller than St. Pete Beach, but, uh, but it was a full service community, had, had everything, but, uh, but basically fire and wastewater. Um, in 2017, I was recruited by uh, Bill Horn, the former manager of Clearwater, to come over and be his assistant town manager, city manager. Um, and I did that uh, uh, until January of this year. Uh, I've served in a couple different roles there. One is the assistant uh, city manager. Uh, also, I was the interim city manager for a period, and then uh, I uh, finished up as the chief innovation officer. Um, so I've got um, experience in both the larger city of Clearwater uh, and then uh, a little smaller in, in Bel Air, and I think, uh, I think that uh, diversity of experience uh, uh, puts me in a good position to be successful. Thank you. Commissioner Lorenzo. Oh, uh, good evening. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, can you describe your ideal relationship between a uh, city manager and the commission and part two of that between the commission and the city staff or the commissioners and the city staff? Sure. I think, uh, I think the communication is, is of course key with, um, with the city manager and the commission. I mean, I, a big part of what we have to do. And I think I've mentioned to all of you, um, that, you know, I, I kind of look at it from three perspectives. Um, uh, I, my expectation of you as commissioners, right, is that um, you're going to take your own personal perspective, uh, whatever the professional staff perspective is, and then the perspective of those in the community and mash that all together and, and make the best decision you can. Uh, but a big part of that is making sure that you understand what our professional staff opinion is. Um, so uh, we you know, I think that takes constant communication and, and, you know, this is not your full time job in many situations, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, you know, that requires us to, to help educate you all on, you know, some of the impacts of what's going on. So it can't just be, this is the, this, here's the three choices and we need to provide some why that, along with that as well. And I think that really helps. Um, but, um, uh, communication certainly key. Um, and the second part of that was no problem. That would be between the uh, commissioners and your city staff. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, I think that's something that um, you sort of build over time. Um, you know, and I'm not obviously I'm not familiar with with how you all interact with city staff now. I can tell you in in, uh, uh, in Bel Air, uh, you know, the commissioners had a had a you know. They had the ability to speak to our department directors. Uh, I just asked for them to make sure that they uh, told me what, you know, that they were going to be speaking to a department director. And if there was an issue, I'd let them know. Uh, and vice versa, the department directors would express uh, to me, uh, hey, commissioners, come and talk to me about this. But, but we created some, um, you know, guideposts around that, right? I mean, we didn't want uh, it to be, uh, we didn't want to put the commissioners in a, in a situation where maybe they said something that they shouldn't. And we didn't want staff in a position where they felt like they were being directed by uh, the commission. So um, we did lay some ground rules on what kind of conversations they should be having uh, with, uh, with the staff. And they really surround um, getting informed about various issues in the community. Um, so that was really our focus. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Mayor. Sure. Hi. <laughs> um, could you uh, could you let us know what you think are the biggest opportunities and threats that face St. Pete Beach, both immediately and then a little ways down the road as well? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think um, from an opportunity perspective, um, you know, th there is uh, obviously there is um, um, there's some development issues going on now. I think um, having some good conversation, continuing some good conversation about those things. Uh, about those development projects is important. Um, those things, uh, uh, you know, over the next few years are going to help help shape the um, the, the finances for the city, uh, but also the impacts to the residents. So, um, you know, uh, it, that can sometimes be a threat. It depends on the perspective you're looking at it from. But uh, uh, but it's a real opportunity too to try to try to make whatever the right thing is, right? Uh, to try to drive us towards that thing. Um, I think uh, uh, on the staff side, you know, I know there's been some turnover over the last, uh, last few years. It, it gives us a chance to, to, to reset um, and, and try to figure out what, uh, what matters to us and, and how we can best build a structure that, that can last for, you know, decades, right? We, it's all about trying to, um, trying to build a foundation uh, that we can uh, sort of be successful on, and that really takes uh, you know good alignment with the staff, good communication with the commission. Thanks, All right. <laughs> Commissioner Phelps. Yeah, I'm Mike. Hey. Um, my question is: Could you describe a time or an example in your career that uh, you've brought your community together? Um, sure. I, you know, I mean, uh, let me think here. Uh, how about uh, in Bel Air? You know, I mean, I think, I um, mean, I think it was really surrounding our golf course that we uh, we purchased as part of the Bellevue Biltmore Hotel redevelopment. Um, you know, th that redevelopment uh, uh, was was uh, you know was very contentious uh, related to historic building, um, and you know, it was a tough probably six seven years that we went through that uh, that process uh, with all the lawsuits and those sorts of things, um, but. But really, uh, the opportunity that came out of that um, that whole process was us being able to capture some green space within the community and and save another element of uh, another part of the of the city uh, from being uh, you know, having some development that was was not something the community wanted. Uh, so we were able to preserve the green space and uh, um, and put a cons conservation easement on there. City purchased the property. Uh, and uh, uh, you know it, it required us to to reach out to all the residents in the area around the golf course and you know throughout the community to you know see if that was the thing that that, that development element was something that they wanted us to do or not wanted to do um, and so we uh, uh, we tried to coalesce around that um, uh, came up with some great projects that we uh, we discussed related to stormwater and and whether or not we could turn it into a um, uh, like a almost a, a recreational facility, and yet also capture stormwater, cancel out a number of different projects that we had uh, downstream for uh, stormwater uh, by just reversing the flow back to the um, golf course. So we had a lot of these conversations about, you know, kind of cool ideas that we might be able to uh, accomplish um, with this property. What ended up happening uh, really was that it, it was a redeveloped as a golf course, but it remained green space. But those conversations really excited a lot of people, I think, in the, in the community, and uh, really, people really came together on it. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Wisniewski. <laughs> Hi, Micah. Hello. <laughs> what are your strategies for hiring, evaluating staff, uh, measuring their performance, retaining them, and then also uh, managing underperforming staff? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, mostly the, the hiring a staff element would would really be the department directors uh, that, that that level. I, I think below that, I would really um, ask the uh, the whatever the respective director of that area to um, to really take the lead on that. Um, but I mean, I think all those things that you talked about uh, really come down to um, to creating some alignment about what 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 matters to us. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a long-term basis, really what values we have as a city uh, from the employees, right? I mean, what, and, and they exist already, but what, what do they have from a value perspective? What are the values of our staff? And what areas do we really want to um, sort of drive towards, right? What are our aspirational values? Um, and, and those things that, are, um, that really are, um, you know, you, you can't be here if you don't have them. Things like ethics and integrity, those things. So, I mean, I think it's important on the front end of uh, whoever takes this position for uh, for us to coalesce around 
uh, what those things are that are important and have some good alignment about it and then base the hiring off of those things right we ought to be hiring people that meet those uh, those elements those values um, uh, and you know I mean I think uh, as it relates to retaining I, I, you know obviously there's various things that um, can be done from a compensation perspective if things are uh, if we're low on something right we need to continue to look at benefits and, and compensation and see where we are uh, on the totem pole there but um, but a, another big part of retention is is creating an environment for staff where um, you know it's collaborative and they feel like they're making a difference right um, like whatever they're saying matters and they're involved in the conversation and uh, you know I think we have a real opportunity to be able to do that here at St. Pete Beach thank you commissioners any of you have any follow-up questions before I ask the closing questions okay so what what particularly um, makes you interested in taking this position yeah, I mean, I, I, is a local position, obviously, so that is helpful to me, um, you know. Uh, but uh, but really, uh, you know, it's the opportunity, you know. I mean, I you know, at least read in the paper about um, the different challenges in St. Pete Beach, uh, or at least perceived challenges in St. Pete Beach, and there's a lot of great opportunity there to um, to I think rebuild uh, rebuild the staff, uh, rebuild some of the culture in the organization and and try to try to take it to the next level um so those are the things that really kind of excite me when i'm you know when i'm looking at uh, different positions right that that employee element the the culture really driving towards um you know changing how people experience work um not just um you know not just fixing a road or or um, dealing with a, a development issue but really what you know how do we build that structure how do you build that foundation and it seems like there's a good opportunity to do that here thank you and then in closing is there anything else that um you would like to add anything else that you would like us to know anything you'd like to this is your free for all yeah i mean i guess i'm you know the I, if i had a question uh for each of you i mean it would be just wh where do you where would you like to see st pete beach just in the next six months or so and um, is there is there a vision that you will have of where we need to try to be by let's say october 1 start of the fiscal year <laughs> I'm sure we do. <laughs> yeah. not be the you can pass. It's okay. <laughs> it might not be the best setting for it. No, no. Um, it might Fair be a long answer. We might be here for a few hours. Right? Fair enough. I retract. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't have anything outside of outside of that. Then no. Thank you, Micah. Yep, I appreciate it. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. If you'll please state your name for the record. Good evening, Mayor Commissioners. I'm Fran Robustelli. Good to see you again, Fran. Thank you. Good to see um, you all. So we're, we each have one question for you. Um, same question we've asked all the other applicants. Um, but before we get to the questions, we want to give you an opportunity just um, in your own words, kind of explain as to you know, why you think you'll be a good fit um, for this position. Okay, thank you. So maybe I'll start with providing a little bit of background because that sets a good foundation for what I may be able to help here, um, bring here to serve this community. So I pretty much have served my entire professional career since college graduation in public service. I graduated from University of South Florida with a bachelor's in biology and I have a master's in public affairs from the University of Missouri. Um, that was with a concentration in public administration. I have spent 
um, about five years in city management um, and about uh, six years in a, as assistant city manager and prior to that as a human resources director and human resources manager for various sizes of organizations. Um, my first 10 years was in human resources in a special district that is similar size to the city, about 120 employees, so close to uh, what uh, you have here. And uh, the last uh, few years I've been in cities ranging from uh, 5,000 residents to 160,000 residents. So I have a broad background. Um, I would describe myself now with a lot of expertise in human resources, but also a generalist in all of city management. Uh, the cities I have served have had um, very complex issues in land use, development, um, climate sustainability. Uh, financial issues, uh, managed uh, one of the largest cities through a recession. Uh, so I have a lot of experience in labor relations and working with employees on um, uh, benefits and compensation. And um, have worked uh, currently in my current uh, city in San Leandro, we are working through some major development that is also challenging for the community. So very similar to some of the things you're dealing with. Uh, that uh, concerns are raised around development and um, how it's how it's done, and um, and how we approach it with the community. So I'll stop there and maybe try to weave some more of my background into your other questions. Thank you, Commissioner Marriott. Oh, back to me. There we go. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Um, so in uh, in in a brief synopsis of a big question. Um, could you let us know what you perceive to be our biggest opportunities and threats for St. Pete Beach, both immediately and then a little ways down the road? Yes, absolutely. So a lot of it has been helpful because I've been able to talk to all of you in the community. So what's surfacing for me is uh, you definitely have some infrastructure challenges. You're not alone. Um, there are, I don't think there's a city probably in the U.S. that doesn't have these challenges. And um, so really looking at not only what the immediate needs are and whether you're prioritizing correctly in your capital improvement plan, but also looking longer term, do you have um, do you have a proper inventory? Do you have the studies you need to actually make the right decisions? And how is the commission prioritizing uh, the infrastructure of the city? Uh, it, and all of that with feedback from the public and what are you hearing from your community that they want you to focus on? Um, also, it's, um, you definitely have some internal organizational challenges that I think uh, need some investment in your people. Uh, I have heard from um, your own department head team and you all with uh, you know wanting to increase morale. Uh, and I have uh, a lot of experience and examples in, in uh, prior organizations of uh, managing teams, creating high performance teams, whether they're uh, existing employees, whether we're promoting employees into new positions and how to invest in that career development and professional development for them, as well as putting in systems where you can actually uh, measure and improve morale. And I have a, a proven track record of doing that. And I would uh, just highlight, it's one of my passions, it's why I wanted to be a city manager because what's happening on the outside is really a symptom of what's happening on the inside. And so if you don't fix the inside of the house, your services will suffer, your approach to the community will suffer, your customer service will suffer. And so I'm, I'm really a big proponent of making sure that the inside of the house is properly supported, resourced, and invested in. And then, um, so infrastructure, I think organization. And then the last thing that's standing out to me is really communications. And there's a lot of opportunity here to communicate better with your public and the residents that live here and really helping them um, understand the complexity of the issues you're dealing with, uh, how you're pushing out information, and not only just on the key projects that you're working on now, but what are the projects that are coming down the road in a few years, several years. Um, and, and making sure that they see what the city's doing and what their taxes are paying for. And the other thing is there's so many services that you all offer that the community doesn't 
um, may not understand the complexity. I, I like to use wastewater as an example, um, but there's a lot that goes behind delivering that service. And so it's highlighting not only for the public, but the employees feel good when they are, when their experiences of providing service to the pub public are shared with the public. Um, I have extensive experience in expanding communication and outreach with the community um, in uh, social media platforms, print, um, in-person community meetings, and really going to the community where they are so that you can connect with them and not making it so that they have to come to City Hall. So th that would be the three top things I, that stand out to me spending the last couple days here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Fields. Hi, Fran. Welcome back. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question is, can you describe a time or an example in your career that you've brought your community together? Yes. Yeah, so recently in the current community I am, we've had, um, we had a significant um, incident uh, with police and a shooting that uh, was actually ended up, uh, we had a high school it was a high school graduate that ended up homeless and ended up um, dying from this police shooting. And so uh, this all happened during the George Floyd national incident and we had uh, riots in the town. And so the community went through a very, very extensive uh, grieving and healing period. And so um, I actually inherited all of that um, about six months after it happened. And one of the things the council um, had explained to me was they wanted to go through really that community healing. How do we do that? And so my first step was to find out um, where were the key leaders in the community that were, were leading the charge behind what change they wanted to see based on the events that had happened in the community. And so um, took some time to get to know each one of those. There, I, I always say there are community leaders in the shadows, and those are the ones that are really organizing and getting people together around issues of concern, no matter what the concern is. But the key is that you understand those leaders and you, and you work with them personally, um, connecting the, we call it city council in California, so, <laughs> but working with the commission uh, to connect uh, the, the, the council or commission are a really good resource for your city manager to understand because you're closest to the community. But the city manager also needs to understand the issues so that they can help advise the commission on the more technical aspects that may be going on. So bringing together the, those community leaders, having um, community meetings around the issues. Uh, we had an organized group that came together to uh, work on some reform. And so we worked behind the scenes with this, this team of community members to say, what, what would you like to see? What are your concerns? How do we do this reform? And the, the beauty to that is, so we, bring, we ended up bringing an ordinance forward with some um, police oversight. And the more you're able to connect with the people as you're planning to present things to the elected body to make decisions, um, and you're really working with them. And we didn't agree on everything but you explained why I can't do that. Or um, there were things they wanted that went against our charter. And we just, you know, you're not going to be able to do this, but we can make that happen. And by the time we got to the council, we had a smooth um, presentation and, and adoption of the ordinance. And that's what you want to try to do. By the time you get to this space, you have really done some significant outreach and people understand all the nuances of why you may or may not be able to do things. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Resnicki. Hi, good evening. Um, what are your strategies for hiring, evaluating staff, um, measuring performance, retaining the employees, and also managing underperforming staff? Okay. I will start with um, hiring. So I'm a big proponent that people, you, not only do you need to brand your city, for your community, because that creates the culture and values of your community, but you also have to brand your organization. And people, I always say people leave their supervisor, they don't leave an organization. And so um, it's really in, in imperative that the leadership in your, in your organization is strong and that people want to come work for them. 
And in order to do that, you have to brand the culture of the organization. So I've spent a lot of time in this area of what do we represent as an organization inside? Um, what do we value as employees? And setting that vision for the organization is gonna be really important to get that employment brand out there. Um, and, and then you need to tell people what it is. And so we've done some really creative things um, in even our brochures of talking about some of the fun things we do or what do we value or what can you expect from career development. And so uh, that will attract people that want to come and see what, what, are, what is, what, what am I gonna get out of this employment experience? Because it is, it's a two-way relationship. As far as performance management, I have extensive experience in this space. Um, I am a, a proponent of high feedback, um, accountability. I would say I have high standards, but I also will highly resource people. Um, and the key to performance management is that you're open, honest, transparent, and you provide employees a pathway. And whether it's a pathway, um, you need to understand where, they are, where they're at and what they need to succeed. Um, you need to set a path or a vision of where you wanna take the organization because some people will opt out. If the leader sets and says, this is where we're going, these are the expectations, and I've, this has happened everywhere I've gone, you'll have someone, somebody will opt out and say, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna get on that bus, okay? But as long as you're clear with people, I, I like to give people options to make choices for themselves. And as long as you're clear in setting those expectations and really communicating regularly, giving feedback regularly in real time, not waiting for the annual performance evaluation and all year you say everything's great and then all of a sudden you surprise them and say, well, it really wasn't. And remember that time eight months ago, that's demoralizing. And so I'm just a very big proponent, high expectations in this space that people know what's expected, um, what the consequences if, if it doesn't get delivered, and also creating a very safe space so people can also give feedback up. Um, it's, it's really hard in the top spot to get feedback up. I work really hard to create that safe space where you've gotta tell me what you need from me and what I, what I may be doing that may be hindering you from being successful. Did I answer all five of those points? Okay. I think you missed the last one. Oh, what was the last one? Underperforming staff. So underperforming staff, um, when you're underperforming, if you work for me, you will know you're underperforming. You will not have to guess. So um, I'm really key on letting people know that, and you don't have to wait till the annual evaluation. It just has to be real time. Like this is the deficiency. This is what we need to fix. Um, if I'm at a point in underperformance, I'm now documenting and I'm letting people know. I'm not just talking anymore now, I'm, and I will let them know. I'm going to document this because I want to make sure we're very clear because the last few conversations haven't actually, we're not communicating. You know, if I'm asking you to do A and you keep doing B, I'll take responsibility for some of that communication. And so when I move into underperformance, I am documenting, I let people know. I hate surprising people. You know, there's nothing worse than you have a conversation and then you get an email from somebody like, that's not what she said. So I'm very, very mindful that people know um, what I'm doing and, what, and how I wanna help them be successful. Um, if I have a deficiency, I'm working very hard to find out too what they need. How can I help you? Because everyone doesn't work the same. And so it's really trying to figure out how do you help that person be successful and give them the tools that they need. And at some point, I've had people where they're like, I just can't do this job. You know, I don't like this job. And so at that point, you're like, I will help you find where you fit. And I've, I've been successful in redeploying people and some elsewhere in the organization or even helping them move on to another position because I'm very passionate about this topic because we spend more time working than we do with our families. And I don't want people to be miserable. Like it's not okay for you to come to work and be unhappy and have a bad attitude. Like the baseline expectation is you show up and you're super excited to be here because you spend more of your life here and, and you deserve it and, and we deserve that too. Thank you. Thank you.
Commissioner Renson? Well, sorry you're not getting to see some good Florida weather, but at least we don't have earthquakes, right? I was super excited about the storm today. I drove through the neighborhoods. I got to see all the, I call them puddles. Um, so a so, uh, question for you is, uh, how would you describe your ideal relationship between you and the city commission? Part two would be between the city commissioners and your staff that work for you. So um, first I'll start with the commission and I seek to build a relationship of trust first. Um, I also want you all to know that I'm never going to surprise you and I don't want to be surprised. So really opening that communication. Um, that's why I mentioned before, you know, having a city manager out in the community, you can't be everywhere all the time. And so those are even some of the things that I like to tell my commission. If I hear something, I'm like, oh, this might be a pinch point or this might be something that certain people are upset about. So just to prepare you so you're not surprised when you're in a public meeting that um, you may have uh, various challenges or questions you're going to want to ask staff. Um, I do like to meet regularly with the commission. Uh, I try to go to where you're at. I have uh, currently council members that like to meet weekly. Some like to meet every other week. Some like to meet in person. Some like Zoom. And so I just try to be really flexible. I know that some of you have full-time jobs on top of this volunteer job that you're, you're uh, doing so grac um, graciously for your community. And so I really try to, to help you um, have me accessible, but also in your space so that you're not um, overly strained. Um, I, I'm pretty much uh, very available. I'm, I make myself, um, you know, you're, you'll, you, you would become my top five on my answer the phone list. Um, so <laughs> just being available and, and knowing if I'm not available, when can I be available to you? And um, so that just to me, that's open, transparent communication and really making sure that trust is always in place so that we can really work through anything. As far as staff in the commission, um, I, the, the way I've managed um, is that I really like my directors to have access to, I like you to have access to my directors, um, and they just keep me informed. So I try to give that latitude so that it's easier for you all to get information if you need it quickly. But, and then if, if it's in person, my directors would know, they're letting me know, hey, this is an issue, or I had this question. And one, that is so that we can all be on the same page. Two, I'm trying to manage workload for the directors to make sure that, you know, they're not getting 20 requests from one commissioner and, and then they're confused by what the priority is. So just keeping me in the loop of, yep, that's our priority, keep going, or nope, it's not. Let me talk to the commissioner and see if we can renegotiate some of the expectations that they're asking for. Um, I do try to uh, uh, shield the staff beyond directors from the electeds because they can feel pressured to do things that maybe um, are not what their assignment was from their supervisor. And so just keeping that really nice line of communication and everyone knows the line of communication and that we're all kind of working together to make sure that information's flowing smoothly. Um, and then it doesn't put the employees in an awkward situation because they want to make you happy. And so they're going to just naturally, if you ask them to do something, uh, even if you inadvertently do it, they're going to do it. And so it's just helping them not feel that pressure and that the directors manage that workload so they're not feeling like they're running all over the place. Response, thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have any follow-up questions before I ask the final two? All right. <clears throat> um, last question before closing is, um, why are you interested in this position in particular? Thank you. Um, I know some people have been like, why is this person from California interested in this little small beach town in Florida on the Gulf Coast? Well, um, I actually grew up in uh, Lakeland, Florida, born and raised there. And I uh, mentioned I did my undergrad in USF, so spent a lot of time as a young adult on the Gulf side of the beach world, and including St. Pete Beach. And um, my uh, husband convinced me to go back to California in our early 20s. He was from there. 
And so we've raised our, we have three boys, we've raised them, and um, it wasn't a matter of um, when, if we come back to Florida, it was really, when are we going to come back? And um, I wasn't actually looking to leave my current organization. I love it, I love my team. It'll be very difficult to leave if that's the direction we end up going. But um, I got, uh, re uh, Renee reached out to me through her recruitment firm and I never get East Coast uh, brochures, so I thought this must be some sort of fate and was I looking at this exact time? No, but I do know that these opportunities are very rare. Um, you're at a, a great point in your um, history of the city and where it goes in the next decade, several decades, um, and that is exciting to me. And so that was, I just decided, you know, it's too much of a alignment of the stars to not at least explore whether this was a good fit and my leadership um, skills were a good match for you to move your city forward. Thank you. And so in conclusion, is there anything else that you would like to say or for us to know? It's, you have open floor. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I just want to first thank you all. I know this has been a very, um, involved process, but it can, I can tell that you really care about um, who you select, and you should. Um, the selection of your city manager um, will be key to how you move forward and the leadership that you need. And um, I would say that I think I bring to you top tier A plus leadership skills. And it doesn't matter whether um, what your area of expertise in, it, you have a lot of complex issues to work and navigate through. And so I would just offer that if you look at hiring someone who, has, who is highly skilled in um, leading an organization, creating the process you need to then get the outcomes you want in the community, um, moving that culture change in a positive direction, that I think you're gonna get the best results. And a good leader is gonna know where to put the top talent to get the outcome you want, whether it's in your capital program, whether it's in your streets, whether it's in sea level rise, all of those things, um, it matters who's at the top. Not what their technical expertise is, but how good they are at bringing people together, collaborating and communicating. So I just wanna end with that. I think I bring some of those skills um, in, in to this role, I would love to come serve this community and work with you all. I've enjoyed getting to know you, each of you, and I, I know even you're in flux, and I wanna uh, maybe leave you with, I, I, you're, a lot of you are new. I have experience in managing newer councils, and I think um, commissions, and I think that's important because you're gonna need an experienced city manager to help make sure that you all have the technical background that you're gonna need to move forward. And I would love to offer you that expertise. So thank you very much, and um, good luck. <laughs> thank you, Fran. <coughs> okay. Um, I think what we could do is if we each want to fill out our interview form for today, give that to Renee. And then recess and come back at 6.30 and then Renee will have 15, 10, 15 minutes to kind of do a tally. Um, and then you can, if you want to come back and just give us a summary of what. What it looks like. Yep. Sure. How's that sound? Thank you. And then we'll talk about it. Obviously. Yes, and then we'll deliberate and see where we go from here. Great. So let's recess.
Question? Renee, if you're ready. Or if you need another minute, that's all right, too. Um, two minutes. All right. <clears throat> so, I mean, we can have some discussion. I, I will say, this is, again, I'm speaking for myself, not for the rest of everyone here, but um, Renee turned out to be somewhat of a prophet. She warned us that, worst case scenario, we might have more than one good candidate and that there might be a tough decision ahead. <laughs> and um, I, can, I can certainly see how that's, that's a possibility here. Yeah, I agree. I um, I think Renee did a terrific job with the candidates. It's easy to say, oh, that there's no bad candidate. I like them all for different reasons, but that is the truth. Um, it's hard, it, and it's hard to do. I actually worked in recruitment a little bit in New York City, and it's it's hard to do. Um, but I'm ex I've been excited to, to be a, a part of the process. I think it's gone really well. Um, so I thank Renee. I thank city staff. I, I think it's been a really good process the past couple of days. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, for all those kind comments. It's been a process for sure. I know I put you through a lot the last few days, and um, I think we've got to where we need to be. I think um, to, to um, your credit, um, we've gotten through a lot. You've had to process a lot of information, meet a lot of nice people, have a lot of conversations. But I, I think um, we've managed to um, find some excellent candidates. Again, I feel good about the candidates that were recommended. I felt everyone need, deserved to be at the interview table here in St. Pete Beach. So thank you for the, um, for, for, op for the opportunity to work with you and um, for being so gra such gracious hosts. Quite frankly, the community was to our candidates lately. I really appreciate that. Um, so we still have some work to do. <laughs> um, the, the goal tonight is if you're so inclined that we would come up, uh, we would discuss candidates, we would discuss the rankings. I've, I've tallied and retallied in various ways these numbers. Um, and, um, and then based on just conversations of discussing candidates and where we lie in, the, in our ratings, uh, we, we decide who our top candidates is. Maybe we have a top two candidates um, that are real close or maybe even. Um, and, and take time to talk about candidates, kind of why we land where we do. I think that's important. Um, I never expect, in this case, um, I never expect to have a 5-0 on a single candidate because there's just too much to take in. So I think it's going to warrant some explanation and some and discussion about candidates, quite frankly. Um, that's helpful sometimes in just seeing if we can come to a consensus. Um, I often ask, what, no matter where we start, uh, when we finish, and we've decided on a particular candidate to move forward, if that's where we get, that we uh, perhaps take a vote, and I don't call it a courtesy vote, I call it a, um, a support vote, quite frankly, for whoever the person is that we move forward to start discussions with about uh, an agreement. So tonight, we're just trying to narrow it down, see if we have a final candidate that we're interested in moving forward. We still have some yardage to go. We still have to negotiate terms. We still have to come to an agreement. We still have to have a contract and involve uh, the attorney in, in setting up a contract and things like that. But this is the start of that process. We're involved in that and we'll move it forward as we go. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, when discussing candidates and coming up with a decision, you know, we, we may decide that we like two of them so much that we want to start negotiations with a particular candidate. And if we cannot come to terms with that candidate, we did like our, our second choice, if you will. Uh, sometimes it's just a hair difference. And um, if we can't come to agreement with one candidate, we would want to pursue another one. We have several good candidates here, and so sometimes that's exactly um, what happens. Something I will ask for later, uh, Mayor, is uh, for you to discuss a point of contact for negotiations with candidates. Sometimes that's the mayor, sometimes it's the mayor and the attorney, sometimes it's the outgoing city manager, interim city manager, so that's something that we'll talk about tonight going forward. Um, and then I'll also mention after we discuss candidates the items that are typically included in an agreement. So, so if there's a need for discussion tonight about any of those items, we can do that. Otherwise, I just want you to be aware of some things that you may see in an offer to a candidate. So that said, Mayor, I have, um, I have tallied the, the, um, the ranking sheets from yesterday and the ones from tonight. So I'm going to share um, overall how those came out so you kind of know where we stand. 
Um, so just keep in mind that the lower the number, the better. Because literally, if they were ranked number one on a sheet, I gave them one point. If they were two, I gave them two. So um, our group for um, yesterday, uh, for the one-on-ones, um, our totals, uh, and I'll start from the lowest number first, which would be the most, the highest ranking candidate, um, uh, is Fran Robustelli um, with um, eight points. I'll do a point system here. Um, the next candidate is Kevin Cowper with 11 points. The next candidate, and there's a bit of a differentiation here, um, is Michael Maxwell with 16 points. Jim Harriet, 18 points, and Glenn Adams, 22 points. So those are the rankings, the numerical rankings that came from the one-on-one -on -one scoring yesterday. Again, as I told you, you're not, that's not in cement, that's changeable. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think you did a good job as far as scoring candidates as you went. So I, I, think, um, I think we have some fairly good numbers there. With regard to the numbers today, and I double, triple checked them, um, uh, some similarities there. Um, again, the lower number is the um, higher ranking candidate. So Fran Robustelli, again, um, uh, is on the top of the list with seven points today. Um, Kevin with 10 points. Uh, Mr. I'm sorry, Fran Robustelli, Kevin Cowper, 10 points. Um, Jim Harriet, 18, Glenn Adams, 18, and um, Micah Maxwell, 19. I do want to say a couple of comments about those last rankings. Um, we had some um, rankings on your sheets for tonight's interviews that m multiple candidates were ranked at the same number. Okay, there was just, you know, n not the ability to really differentiate between those particular candidates. I gave them all the lower scoring number. So these rankings I still feel are, are um, valid rankings. So that gives you some idea there of where the rankings are for yesterday and today. And I think that's a good starting point, Mayor, of any conversations that we need to have about candidates. I think we have, um, again, a bit of a different differentiation between Mr. Cowper and the next candidate. So I think we have, I would say our top two candidates based on these rankings alone. That said, we need to have conversations because again, you may change your mind, you may change your ranking and that's, that's fine. That's what we're here for. So with that said, Mayor, I'll turn it over to you and however you'd like to proceed as far as discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, would you all be agreeable for us to discuss the top two candidates yeah. for the time being? I mean, it's, it seems like it's a, it's a, it's a significant gap. Yeah. Yeah. Like one and two are close and then it's just yeah. a, a, wide, a wide gap. So maybe... Um, could, I, could I ask one question before sure. we start doing that? Um, and I don't know if this is a, a, like a caution for myself or, or for us as a commission. Um, without final background screening on a candidate, um, I would hate to rank somebody, you know, like have the discussion, rank somebody, but we don't have that information back yet. You know, so I, I guess I want a little counsel on that, whether we should do that. Um, sure. Or maybe it's been done already and I don't, and I, I don't know. If I could just bring you up to date on where we are with that. Um, I went ahead and um, took the liberty of moving forward so we would be as far along as possible here. I do want to make this known to you. Any decision you make tonight about moving a candidate forward is contingent. It's not in stone, it's contingent. It's contingent on backgrounds clearing, on reference checks, whether I did them or whether you want to do them. It's contingent on, um, on everything, on any kind of onboarding exercises or onboarding uh, requirements that the city has, maybe drug testing, I'm guessing, and things like that. That said, I can tell you with regard to these two candidates primarily, um, Ms. Robustelli's background has cleared. Um, the last item to clear was her master's degree at University of Missouri, I believe. And um, it, there was just a, a kind of a, um, it, there, it's usually done through a clearinghouse. It's usually automated for whatever reason it did not 
populate that way, but I have um, obtained a copy of her degree and her information and fed it to the background company to say, okay, here's your stuff, finish it. So it's one item. And when I say one item, we have checked, um, we've checked driving records. We're looking primarily for DUIs or things like that. Uh, and you know they'll have access to a company vehicle more than likely, so we wanna know. We check education. Um, we check um, criminal records, civil records. Uh, we check um, uh, all, all kinds of you know, widescreen databases for sexual offenders, for um, uh, you know, all sorts of things. I think credit may be in there. We cannot make a decision on credit. And uh, quite frankly, that's not something that would be in their personnel file. It would be a summary that we've checked these things. Um, but there's a lot of things that we have checked. So I feel very comfortable um, as far as her background check. We have done some references, which you have those reference comments. We can do more if you would like. If you want to call a council member before you hire a city manager away from them, you're welcome to do that. But, but that should not um, hinder us from moving forward. You should have a comfort level about this. So I hope I covered everything, and I didn't want to jump in for the attorney, but if we're, if we're good. Um, the same with Mr. Cowper. We have done his background checks. Um, we had to update his because we did his not long ago, and so that's still in progress, but again, I, I have no concerns about Mr. Cowper and his background um, moving forward, and I, I wish I could guess at how quickly it's going to finalize, but the truth is I don't have control over that, but I know the typical background only takes a few days to finalize, so I believe with these two candidates, we are in a good position to go ahead and feel comfortable moving forward. Again. Everything's on contingency. It will say that in an offer. I will state it here publicly. Any communications we have about a contract, it's that, that wording is there. Thank you, appreciate it. Sure, you're very welcome. Thank you, because I had the same question about references, for instance. I mean, we, we do have them, yeah. but I certainly would love the opportunity to give a few people a call and you know, Absolutely. be able to speak with them one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely, and, and uh, I will just say too, with Ms. Robostelli's situation, um, you know, in Florida, it's just tough on public sector candidates to apply for these jobs, especially if they're working for a council or commission currently, because they're taking a risk of losing their current job. Yep. That's just the way it is. Um, councils are very nice, and they want managers to move on and do greater things, but the reality is when they find out someone is competing somewhere else, it often just is hard to overcome. And so she's on the West Coast, and um, her hope was that a decision would be made tonight um, because she's, you know, she's managed this as well as she can. Um, so in that regard, you know, I think I, I would just want to emphasize the need to move forward expeditiously and not drag things out for two or three weeks. But to your point, this is the time where, you know, I would give you the contact information of her commissioners or whomever, and she would feel comfortable with that because we're in a different discussion now if she is your final candidate, right? It's, it's time to open that door, right? We didn't want to do that up until now. We talked to people who were closely to her or for her. Um, the same with Mr. Cowper. You know, we don't want to shake that bush unless we know that's the direction that we're going in. So to your point, Mayor, we would provide anything you need in the, in the way of um, additional references for you to communicate with. Just a quick follow-up, um, which I, I think you may have just answered the question that I had, which is um, with Fran, it, it seemed like it was a maybe potentially open-ended whether she would even be interested if the offer were made, but it sounds like from her asking the question about how quickly a decision could be rendered that she would in fact be interested in accepting the position if offered. Yes, sir. Okay. I think any of these candidates would be excited about getting an offer. I, you, you particularly made a, a point, uh, I think, at the last <laughs> meeting, uh, or maybe when we spoke, to say it's right. like, you know, she has a very good situation where she's at. Yes. It would have to be a, a really yes. good fit for her to make the decision yes. to move. Uh, yes. It is cross country, it is a long way. It's, yes. Um, um, she is very committed to this. Okay. I've checked in with candidates over the last couple of days, and because they're looking at you, you know, sure. too. And um, I think she's been very happy with what she's yeah. seen here. I, mean, I just would hate That's to have a, a number two who finds out that they were a number two just because we offered it to the first person and yeah. then it was never even an option. Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Commissioner Fitz. Yeah. Uh, so my question that I think is somewhat important for us to know, and I understand it's part of contract negotiation, but is start date, because both of these individuals would be moving from out of state. Yes, um, I do know that uh, Ms. Robostelli has a, in her contract, her current contract, um, there is a 60 day notice that she has to give. Um, so it would not be sooner than that. 
as of now. What, it what happens a lot of times is once the decision is made and the city perhaps, you know, where she currently works gets their game plan in place for a replacement or an interim or what have you, many times they'll say, you know what, we're gonna be good. If you wanna go in 45 days, it's good. They don't hold candidates to 60 days, but currently that is what's in her contract. Um, Mr. Cowper would need at least 30 days. And mind you, these are 30 days or 60 days from the date that an agreement is put in place, not from today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, is, is there a way to handle it uh, with sensitivity that, let's say we've got two that we all love and it appears we do, um, where we don't kind of turn the number two person off, kind of what you were alluding he's to. He's gonna watch the video today. Yeah, <laughs> if he's not watching it right now. <laughs> we love them all. I thought about it. I thought I had the same thought. Yeah. I'm like, I bet you they're out back somewhere watching it on their phones right yeah, now. Yeah, you're, you're a good point there, Mayor. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> because number one person, whoever we pick, could in, in reality turn it down in a week and go, you know what, oh. Um, Commissioner, that is a great question. I have no problem asking um, then the number two ranked candidate today, if they would still be in consideration for this position should something fall through. They understand this world that you live in and this dynamic of the industry that, that happens sometimes. I really think that the level of interest in your community is very high by these candidates. Um, so I, I can't predict, but um, you know, I have no problem address, uh, addressing that and, and having that conversation. I think that'd be wise. Yes, yes. And I think, I think even the discussions we are having, um, in this case about if it, Mr. Cowper is the number two candidate, I think they're very solid and very good and supportive discussions we're having here. Um, I, I think, you know, this is hard sometimes. It's very hard. Um, you're splitting hair sometimes when it comes to candidates. And, you know, you have to make your best decision and try to move forward and see what that is. And sometimes, you know, events happen and things happen and things change but I think being I think if nothing else these candidates understand local government and being open and knowing that things can change and not to shut a door and not shut it quickly so I, I don't know if that helps but that's my take just one more remark uh, since they probably are watching on the phones uh, <laughs> allude to what the mayor and Commissioner Phil said I, I was floored by all five of them I thought they were I mean every one of them I would love to work with I didn't see anything there. I could joke that I was hoping three of them would walk in with like three eyeballs and go, okay, <laughs> they're off the table, but great, great people, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I think you. whatever concerns we had whittling it down from 95 to five. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I just kind of list some terms here that you might anticipate. If you want to talk about candidates first and, uh, and make it formal, sure. who we're talking about. Let's have a quick deliberation real quick. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. let's deliberate. And okay, then, let's do um, it and then we can talk next steps. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, yeah, I, I certainly want to talk about it. I think that ranking system that Renee came up with is phenomenal. Um, I really Absolutely. like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really like that. Um, but I certainly don't want to rely just on that for all of us making a decision. I, I want to talk about it because maybe there's some things um, I missed. Fran was not my number one candidate. Uh, I think as far as personality and internally, she is a breath of fresh air. Um, I think her personality is, is phenomenal. Um, I felt that right when she walked in the room when I met with her. Um, however, my top candidate was Kevin. Um, I think he has a lot of experience, both in and out of Florida. Um, I feel that would translate well to our community. Um, he's got a planning background. I think his skill set would transition well with analyzing our comprehensive plan and how it aligns with our community presently. Um, he seemed to grasp the feel of our community extremely quickly. Um, he told me yesterday, he just came in the night before and he was able to recognize things, kind of the feel of the community uh, very quickly. I, I liked his manner his personality, I think he's very intelligent, and I think he's an extremely good listener. So um, that being said, I think Fr Fran is excellent in a lot of ways, but I, I like Kevin's experience a little bit better. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I agonized over those two Me too. for hours, mm -hmm. and I still <clears throat> could have swapped them. Yeah. I, you know, this obviously is a very imp important 
<laughs> decision we all have to make. I mean, it's, it's an opportunity um, uh, because we, we, we're at a time that, you know, it, we all know it's an opportunity for the community, for um, the staff, um, with everything that's that's transitioned through time. So this decision is important. One thing that I was looking at when talking to all of them, and I had both both of ours as a one. I really wanted to put one on both. I did, but I knew I couldn't, but I did have I both had one. I the same line mm -hmm. at the last moment. I did, and, and you could tell by the numbers that it, it's possible there was, um, I don't want to say a struggle, but however you all personally were ranking um, the candidates who were all good in, in their respective manner, but there was something there between these two. One big thing for me is experience um, as a city manager. Um, you know, the, they each have a background experience. You know, obviously, um, Fran has experience in HR um, and then city planner um, for, um, for Kevin. Both of those are things that the city needs overall, right? So when we think about the city and if, if we, had had an opportunity to do uh, one of the questions that, that one of the candidates brought back to us. Yeah, I wish we could tell you exactly what the direction of this current commission um, with the mayor have as far as strategy and um, plan or prioritization. Um, but I think we all up here know that those two things are very important um, right now in the city. Um, so which is why hence I struggled um, separating the two. I almost felt like I wish I could just can we make them both one, you know, because they, they had stuff. Obviously, the other candidates did have experiences and professions that, that I appreciate, and, and I know that the, that the city needs, but I also know we have current staff who have that experience or profession that, that I value as well. So, you know, maybe in helping with um, the organization of the city um, and the staff we currently have, we can bring some some more expertise in those other areas, right? So, but planning and NHR was very important um, to me, and experience was extremely important to me. Um, and even though we haven't met all together to kind of come through, what are our policies or direction as a city? Um, I think we all could say that those are two big important things that we have to deal with. But do they have to? We we don't need the leader, and this is my other part. We don't need the leader to be the one doing those jobs, right? But if you have a leader who's able to find, whether if it's help in planning, you know, if you're able to develop the people that you have currently um, and possibly um, recruit new people to help in those situations or areas, then that leadership to me, I think, is more important than saying, well, you have experience in your profession as such, you know. Um, so I, I think she brings that um, to the city, and, and so does Kevin. So I know this is going to be hard, but, <laughs> but the numbers are, are, are close. But, but I struggle with both because I flip both, you know. So I don't know how you're all going to turn my, my flip. But <laughs> it's just it's a hard decision because the, we have so much to do. and, and we just need to make the decision, basically, you know. And, and I think just by looking at the numbers that we all felt that way. You know, I, 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 you know, just look at the numbers, right? That we, we definitely have, we, I know we're calling them one and two, but I see it as ones, both of them, um, uh, because it's so close. The numbers are so close. Th this is a hard decision, and, and um, we, you know, we, we've all said it in different ways, but I, I ended the day yesterday in some ways being very comforted because I went into this process thinking, you know, y you couldn't come up with five people less qualified to hire a city manager than us, you know? <laughs> and so I, g I give a lot of credit to Renee for creating a process that, that, has, that has made us feel like we, we've come up with some good, you know, a, a, a good way, a good path forward. And, and at the end of the day yesterday, I was, I was very relieved to leave with the feeling that, you know what, we can't go wrong. We, you know, like we have five really good candidates. We probably can't screw this up. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to um, interview Fran first yesterday morning when we were both the freshest, right? Because <laughs> it was a long day. Um, and the thing that that um, made her a strong number one for me both yesterday and today 
was the level of excitement that she had yesterday talking about the opportunities and the possibilities of what can happen here in St. Pete Beach. And um, to me, it was, um, it, it, it seems like a really important thing for where we're at to have somebody helping to steer the ship who is really dynamic and excited and optimistic and has a lot of really fantastic ideas about how to help us get through some challenges and to really improve things and bring the community together and move things forward. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I feel like her management skills and her, her recent experiences particularly um, make her a, a, a really excellent candidate for us. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I, I feel like we're very lucky to have her. Now, all that being said, I still feel like we can't screw it up, you know? <laughs> So, uh, so I think we're in a good position. Well, yeah, everything everybody said rings true with me as well. Um, and it was funny, I had some, uh, well, well, first of all, both Kevin and Fran, I think, are going to bring a calming influence to the staff, which I think is, is a good trait. Uh, they're, they're almost kind of like Wayne, Wayne part two here, because um, I think he does a good job as that as well. So I think that's a huge bonus for either one of them. I'll admit I had some bias when I first was reading the resumes. I'm like, somebody's coming from California, and then, you know, especially the Bay Area. And I'm like, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Bay Area that's a lot different than some of the things going on in Florida. Um, so uh, I had a little bit of built-in bias, and it was removed completely. So, I mean, that, w that was huge getting the chance to sit down and talk to her and, and think it through. Um, I think Kevin brings a wealth of uh, experience and kind of that calm attitude, um, which I think is going to be a bonus. So I'm good with either one of them. Um, my one concern is that um, I hope that with Fran, we can work within a budget that's realistic because she is coming from California where things are even more expensive than here. So I, I hope that doesn't become a hurdle um, and it's something we'll have to discuss as well as obviously as, a, a, as commissioners on what we're willing to offer. Um, but I'm I, I echo you, we can't fail. I mean, we have two great folks, so. I'll, I'll Thank like you. to make two comments. Yep. So one, I think the five of us, Commissioner Marriott, are well qualified to pick <laughs> the city manager, I do, and I sincerely mean that. Um, I think the five of us have five different backgrounds. I think we've been through a lot the past few months, and quite frankly, I'm proud of all of us. Um, second, back to the candidates, um, f I'll start with Fran. If she's selected, she's someone I would love to work with. That being said, to me, my pick is definitely Kevin. Definitely. Yeah, I, I don't think you could. I don't think you could go wrong with Kevin at all. Um, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed. I'm, I don't know. Just for me, my interview style is more conversational. So we literally just spend 45 minutes talking, and now we all talk about the same three topics with all five of them. And somehow those three topics happen to be planning and HR, mm -hmm. you know, and so we end up with, with two individuals. But, um, you know, speaking for, with, you know, Kevin, I mean, his experience and his resume speaks for himself. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, if, if you wanted to kind of have like a template for a great city manager resume, that that fits the bill 100%. Um, absolutely enjoyed talking with him, meeting with him. He has a very, you know, and talking to him, the, you know, the things that I wrote down were, he seems very measured, very deliberate, just has a kind of very soothing, calming attitude, um, which probably would be very beneficial when you have 150 staff. Um, you know, but he was also, it, it seemed like he had, you know, he had purpose, right? He, he wasn't doing things just randomly, but rather, um, you know, again, just very measured and, and, and calculating in a, in a good way, you know. Um, um, his, his background, you know, and with planning and, you know, working with large-scale projects, um, you know, working in revitalizing cities, um, I mean, that's, that's something that's, that's certainly needed. Um, so, I mean, those were my comments and thoughts on, on Kevin. Um, you know, with 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 Fran, she is she's a, she's a different 
energy, I think. Um, she's, I, I wrote down no nonsense. I mean, she really seems like she's got, she knows what she wants. She's gonna go get it, whether it's working with the staff to you know, get them where we need to be, whether it's working on projects and so on. Um, the things that stood out to me is, you know, and sometimes it's just in the language that people use. Um, and Kevin did the same thing. In fact, Jim did as well. But you know, they talked about, you know, serving the community. You know, and, and she repeated that type of language multiple times. Customer service in the sense that, you know, our residents. You know, you know, we're not, we're not Publix, right? We're not the phone company, but we are still a body that serves a community. And so, in a sense, there is customer service involved. And, and it, it was refreshing to hear that reflected. And the comments from from the applicants, you know, and particularly from from Fran and from Kevin, um, you know, talking about, you know, how do we how do we take care of our residents? How do we serve the community? Um, right. I mean, ultimately, they they work for the commission, but the commission is put here by the residents, right? So, and, and that's that's the way we serve the community. I I can tell you, in speaking with both of them, you know, they they talked about going out into the community. You know, look, you know, putting their eyes on the issues that we're seeing themselves so they can get a better understanding and handling. And, and in fact, all five of them was waiting for one to say they didn't, but all five of them said, yep, yeah, we went down there, we saw the flooding, we saw what it was. I found that particularly, you know, it was impressive and refreshing that, you know, it wasn't just, oh, we've got an extra nice two days in St. Pete Beach on, <laughs> on the commission's dollar, right? But they used that time, even though it was, you know, free time at your own pace today. They use that in a in a deliberate and purposeful manner. Um, I I don't. Those are my thoughts on the two candidates. Um, I think they. Like I said, I, 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 you're absolutely right. Kevin's resume. Um, I mean, it's it's impressive. Speaks for itself. If the other four weren't there, I would say, yeah, that's the guy, mm -hmm. right? Um, I. For me, I think the only reason I'm, I'm edging slightly more towards Fran, and again, I had them on the same line until the last moment. I'm like, okay, I can't put both of them on, this, <laughs> on the top spot. <clears throat> if I had to put my finger on, on why I, I would, by a very small margin, say, you know, Fran, um, I think it's that level of excitement that I think you saw, that that different energy and sometimes you can hire for experience and you can hire for a resume and you can hire for checking the boxes okay this person has this 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 but you can't like they either have a good attitude or they don't they're either are personable they're friendly they're you know, motivated and driven and excited, or, or they're not, right? They, you, whatever they are, when you hire them on day one, that's exactly what you'll have on on the last day, right? Um, and I, that that to me was just a, by the smallest margin was, you know, again, Jim to me, love to sit down with him, talk about the city issues, and I know he would, you know, sit there and listen and be a great sounding board, and he will do that with all of the staff. And he will get on the community, meet with the leaders, and so on, and do all that. And I think that is, but I also think Fran would do that as well. Um, so for me, by the smallest margin. I can say, because I'm, I'm very much the same. I have, they're both there, right? The, I, they, they were the, from the get go. They, they were actually there, to be honest, before I even met them. Just by looking at the resume, I knew. That, that those two were going to stand out for me. And then meeting them, I, I saw it that way. Experience is very important. Personality important, but there's nothing wrong with being different, right? You don't have to be the extrovert in the party, right? You, you can still be enjoyable in conversation. And, and I thought that way, um, Fran was very um, outgoing or more personable. You know, Kevin, I didn't, I didn't see it that way, but I was um, last night at the, at the meet and greet at a distance, you know, kind of watching. And, and he was outgoing. He was talking to the residents. He wasn't, he wasn't away from others, which I did see others kind of not, take a, took a little more courage, um, you know, to step forward. And I think I was standing with you, Renee, and I was watching from, from the back. And, um, you know, Kevin did. 
you know, and then I, you know, when we interviewed yesterday, one on one, and, and he kind of mentioned it today about the, the love dotham, you know, and he went into a lot of detail with me one on one, which to me, I think is something that um, as much as we all know, we all live here and love St. Pete Beach, you know, I want to, I want to love St. Pete Beach too, you know, on the water tower and, and have our own hats and t-shirts and, you know, he doesn't have to be the rah-rah cheerleader saying it, you know, he says it in a, in a nice way, how he said today, mm -hmm. um, but he knew that was needed. The community needed it, we needed to get that way, and obviously he did, you know, if you Googled, you know, what, what they have over there and, and that these signs are out there, that means that he must have taken the time with the staff and the community to get them there. He doesn't have to have the pom-poms in his hand, right, and, and cheering them on. Um, you could have both, the pom-poms or not the pom-poms. It doesn't mean you don't get the people there. So I, I would not base it off of the personality um, because both personalities are great, right? They're just different. Um, you could be the quiet student in the classroom and you're still you know, great, or you could be the loudest and you're still great, right? Um, and that's the educator in me, right? You do, it, that's not, to me, the deciding factor alone. It's the poor personality that we're, we're worried about, right? And so I don't see that, right? They don't, none of them are bad as far as personality or mannerisms or, or anything of that nature. So, um, and then the key thing is experience, more so to me than Fran, more so about the planning, because it's planning in many areas. It's not, I know we got redevelopment and that's a big thing. We've got the comprehensive plan that we want to address, which is huge, but we have infrastructure issues, which is huge, which has to do with development. And, and speaking with him and with the others as well, um, I wanted to hear about that um, in all aspects of what we're planning for, um, because there's many levels, planning for uh, whether it's restructuring, um, personnel at, at the city level, you know, that takes planning, right? Um, planning for infrastructure, planning for uh, redevelopment, planning for how we're going to get this comprehensive plan, you know, revamped, which we've been talking about, but we've got all this stuff going on at the same time. He understood that we are at a critical time, right? If, if you had a balance beam, you know, we're, we're tipping, you know, but once that beam tips too far, you're not going to bring it back up. Right, and, and, I, and I really enjoyed hearing him say that because, and it's not just about whether we have buildings, and, and I hope the community hears me on that, there's so many other things that can tip, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's not just because you have more um, uh, tourism or hoteliers or, you know, we can tip on many other areas in the city um, that need to be addressed and we need someone with that expertise to talk about all the variety of things that are happening because they're all affecting each other. So. You know, my, my um, ones in that small margin almost tips in talking about it, which is, you know, it's good because I did this last night to myself, you know, so it helps me process it in my mind that that margin becomes smaller because of that, you know, um, and, and also because I want to hear all you all about what you think because I, I hear the personality, but that wasn't, that wasn't what kept them so close to me because I don't think their both personalities are great. You know, yeah, and I don't. I don't think that when I when I talked about her 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 optimism and and the the possibilities she sees with the city, I think that was less about about her personality than it was the the amount of thought and ideas she already had about how to drive things forward. So part of it is how she communicates those things, right? And some of that is personality, um, but a lot of it was the 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 ideas behind it and 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 in our discussion yesterday she talked a lot about um about you know celebrating wins and having having a, a community and a an organization in the city and city employees and and the commission and the community as a whole that can all get together behind celebrating wins and and as a way to you know bring people together and move the community forward and make everybody feel like they're part of part of the team that's being successful and getting somewhere. And so I, I think that was the thing that really stood out to me about, about what, what to me put her it, uh, on the top of the list. And, and, and that's not at all to say that I don't think Kevin is right up there. I mean, clearly his experience is, is very impressive and, and uh, you know, all of the, the local experience and Florida coastal experience is very helpful. Um, but, you know. 
I, I, I just go back to I, I, I don't think we're going to screw it up. So, <laughs> just two very short thoughts. Um, I just kind of took an informal survey of the department heads that I could find, and and they seem to like both these candidates. So that's a good thing. I think there's another check in the box. Um, I mean, the only negative, really, and I hate to even say it's a negative, is that they lack all the local contacts. Mm -hmm. But as everybody else has said, I, I've always believed a, a leader can create those type of things. And I'd rather have somebody that has a, a sharp personality, is engaging, is a teammate, than somebody that's got, like you said, all the technical background that's lacking. So I, I'm good either way. Yeah, and I will say I reached out to a number of, of people as well, um, both some department heads and uh, uh, some residents and, you know, kind of in anybody I could corner to, to who had had an, any chance to review resumes or speak to the people in person last night and, and uh, um, you know, get, get people's feedback. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think everybody was thrilled with the level of candidates that we had. Um, but but for the feedback that I received, there was a, a number of people that, that were very impressed by Fran as well after meeting with her last night from the community, so. Yeah, I think the, the feedback I received on both of them was very positive. Yeah. I, I just wanna add, add one thing about Kevin that I like that, that stuck out is he's worked in Florida, he's been through hurricanes. I know Fran's been through, there's plenty of natural disasters out there as well. But I, I like that um, that piece of it. And as far as community people I've s spoke to in the community, there was a lot of support for, for Kevin as well. Um, but um, positive things I heard about, about Fran also. So. Great. I think, I think one of the, and then again, I, I spoke with both of them. We ran over time. So if, it, it wasn't that for lack of, of good communication. I think one of the other, to your point with you know, having specific knowledge and experience in, in certain situations, coastal cities, you know, hurricanes and so on. I think, um, I think some of the small, unique town experience like Napa, right, to me um, kind of echoed sort of what we have here, right? Napa is in a very different, but very similar, right? Small, heavily tourist driven industry you know, the tension between the residents and the visitors, you know, how do you accommodate that, you know. Um, that was a unique experience that um, I think that that came through in, in that, uh, in, in her resume. Um, because it's, it's, it's tough, I mean, it, and, and I would imagine, if I was a city manager, in some ways, having a normal city of 100,000 people in the middle of somewhere is, might be easier than having to deal with you know, the unique situation that we have, right? Because we're a small town with big city problems. Yeah. You know? but, but what's nice, you know, too, about um, Kevin is because, and he mentioned it today, being in Dotham, it's kind of like being in St. Pete Beach. We got St. Petersburg right next to us, yeah. you know? So he, I don't remember the exact numbers he said, but let's just say he is from a population of 10,000 and then he went to uh, 20,000 and then it's, you know, four times more just right at, you know, Hill, Hillsborough County, Tampa, you know, it's almost the same thing we have here. You know, we have a lot of multiple barrier island city towns, then we're next to St. Petersburg, and then we're, part, Tampa's part of us, right? We gotta all cross that bridge, right? So, so it's there as well, so. No, and with his, yeah. with his Auburn experience, you know, tripling mm -hmm. in size, you know, that's a, that's a significant. Mm -hmm. I think we're there, Mr. Mayor. You are? Well, who would like to make a motion in that case? I'll be the canary in the coal mine. I'll make a motion. Uh, I move to select Francis Robastelli for the position of city manager. Mm. Or a finalist, right? Right, the motion would be to to select her as the finalist for the city attorney or whomever city we City manager. Choose. City manager, well no, for the city attorney to yeah. negotiate with for the well, position. We'll yeah. talk or? about the process once okay. we. I just yeah. want to clarify based on what Renee said. This motion, do we need to include the contingent language? Yes. And Because we always do. Yeah, so like your motion to selecting contingent on 
everything clearing. Everything clearing, background search, you know, just to, yeah. to make sure that there's leeway. Do we need to include um, the, script well. <laughs> the, the motion for adding a backup? Um, just, for, just for any content, just contingent on any backgrounds or onboarding things that the city Certainly. does. We don't fingerprint, we don't drug test. Those are things you do. They will have to pass those things in order uh, for um, you know them to become uh, your next city manager. So the motion should just, I, I, I'm taking it that, that you just want to include the language of that it should be contingent on anything that needs to be right. cleared before uh, being hired on with the city of St. Pete Beach, correct? I'd like to revise my motion. My, my question was uh, really more specifically, do we need to include language about Kevin as, so that if something happens in the next week, okay. Fran drops out, we don't have to wait until the next commission meeting exactly. to start the process. I, I'm asking. I'll see how it could I, I would, personally, I would say we have to wait to the next meeting. Okay. At this point. Um, it'll probably take until the next meeting to even negotiate a contract. I think we could meet the 23rd, but if, I'm also thinking if a contract comes forward and there's not an agreement or meeting of the minds, then at that point we would start with number two. Okay. Yeah. That sounds fair. I've got a question in, like in line with that, and I know when we spoke when you were here previously, Renee, you kind of mentioned numbers that people were looking for, and they weren't totally far off um, between those two candidates, but um, yeah, I guess that's, so that's part of the negotiations. If you can't come to terms with candidate one, whoever that would be, so then it would you'd start negotiating with candidate two. Sounds like we would need a motion to then. Yeah, well, and, and that's usually like how any solicitation works, right? If you can't come into an agreement with someone building a street and you have number two, you move on to number two. Now, I don't remember the numbers that you said. I think you did mention in that last meeting that there was. As far as salary? Yeah, ranges that right. they were yes. both individually looking for. I don't remember those numbers. It, yes. And I think Maybe it would be appropriate for us to have input on that because yeah, I sure. remember uh, yeah. ex-commissioner Grill made that comment and that kind of struck a chord with me that, sure. you know. It's part of the decision, I think. I think you so know, too. So. If, if I may, Mayor, I'm just going to run down items that are typically in an agreement and then of course salary is part of that so we can have a conversation about well, just, that. Just to clarify, the motion is dead. Okay, correct. For the yeah. record. <laughs> lack of a second. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, for lack of a second. So some of the things that we will be negotiating with candidates as a starting date. I think I've talked to you about that already with Fran has a 60 day, but it could become shorter than that. Um, uh, paid time off. Uh, a lot of folks at this level in their career have built up quite a, um, uh, a accumulation of paid time off and it uh, is often, it's, it's, it's very common within the industry to offer them some what I call banked time off from the get-go. Um, three weeks is typical, some get four weeks. Um, and that is because, you know, they're changing jobs mid-year. They have, you know, they, they, you don't want them to start at the bottom so they can't take a day off for another year. They have, they have to move. Um, they have things probably in place. I don't know, high school graduations, weddings, who knows what. Um, and so that's not unusual for there to be some kind of banked time off. Um, Relocation is often a consideration, and you know that varies. Um, I, I've seen it done two ways, and I'm just going to give you the short version here. Um, either you just give them a flat amount of um, money to say, you know, this moves you, whether you move your stuff or not. You know, um, this is the money that we will uh, give you toward a transition or relocation. What I do recommend, and I'll talk with whoever we negotiate with about that, you typically in Florida especially, you wanna put some kind of contingency on that to say if you leave within two years, then you have to pay us back a certain amount. The, the purpose of that is unfortunately, in the years past, people were taking jobs, so people would pay them to move down, and then they'd go somewhere else and work. And it, it's just, um, I, I think it's an, I think it's important to include that in there, so that's not unusual to see that now. Um, car allowance is typical because they are the city manager and used to be you would give them a car, now it's 
more along the lines of car allowance, and there's kind of an average for that of different cities. Uh, and this is probably some of the stuff that is in your former city manager's contract, or maybe even two or three back. These are standard things that I'm talking to you about now. Um, another thing is professional fees and associations. In order for them to participate in organizations that you want them to be part of, there's an annual fee for that. And a lot of times, the city will pay for the city manager's fees to be part of an organization or um, you know, some kind of continuing ed education or whatever. Um, severance is often in an agreement. Um, years, years back, I, I don't know, five years or so ago, the state legislature uh, limited severance for city managers, for public sector administrators um, to 20 weeks, which is five months. Prior to that, you had city managers who were getting a year and a half severance, a year severance, and again, people were taking advantage of that. They would come down and take a job to get fired and then go get another job. So um, the maximum is, is, is 20 weeks. That said, um, severance usually has some contingencies on it of it would have to be they were fired for, for um, they were fired without cause. What that does is it gives them some sort of protection that when a new commission gets voted in, in an election cycle that all of a sudden, if that commission just says, you, we didn't hire you, nothing, nothing against you, but we didn't hire you, we wanna hire our manager, then they have something to help them as far as bridging the gap and getting another position with the public sector agency. That's a very common thing to see among city manager contracts. I think you'll see it probably in some that you have drafted here too. Some other language in there might be regarding performance reviews when they will have those. They will want those. Um, that's an important tool for you if you haven't done this in a past or you haven't been part of doing that as a commission. I highly encourage you to include that. Um, term, of, term of the contract. Um, I, I used to see five-year contracts back in the day. I don't see that anymore. Um, I, I really think a two or a three to start with, a two or three-year contract to start with is good. And you can put in there two additional years of, you know, uh, 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 where they don't have to come back and negotiate the entire contract. It's just an add-on, right? It's a convenience for you and them if you do that. Um, but the reality is when it comes to a city manager, their first year is really getting the lay of the land, right? And the dynamics. And a second year is really when performance, in my opinion, you really see them get out the gate and do what they need to do. Um, and then, you know, by the third year, you've kind of settled in and you know what you've got. And at that point, you know what you wanna, who you wanna keep. Right, and so again, those two add-on, those two-year add, it gets you to a five-year, but it's not a committed five-year, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, you may or may not um, have a request um, for some housing consideration. As far as, um, I think this was in a former city manager's contract here, because of the housing costs on the beach, um, just kind of a, an additional housing allowance each year. I mean, I'm sorry, each month toward what the cost is to live here versus somewhere else. And I'm gonna tell you right now, you don't, they don't have to live here, right? There's a 10 mile radius as far as where they have to live. So it extends over, I think, into St. Pete Beach and maybe some other directions. But the reality is your city manager is gonna wanna live in the beach. It's different. It's different when you're living by the rules that you're carrying out of the commission, right? And so there is a need for that. I, I don't know that someone will ask for that. Again, these folks are smart. They probably got the last contract. There was probably something like that in there. It, there's a possibility. But again, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. And then of course, salary, which we you know, mentioned, um, with these particular groups of candidates, I, I can't ask them what they make. I can dig it out. We can all find it out. It's public for most of them. However, when I asked what they wanted to, what they would like to see as a salary to consider this position and whether there was flexibility, um, I heard everything from, you know, someone wanting to be around the 225 mark up to the 250 mark. And um, Fran was very upfront with me about what her salary is in California, and it's beyond the 250 mark. Uh, you all are right about that. But again, she's taken into consideration that she wants to be here. This is her correct uh, next move, um, next career move. But also, she understands there's no state income tax in Florida. California is very expensive to live in, everybody. So normally I would kind of get concerned if someone was taking a decrease in salary to come somewhere. I'm not concerned here. She's, she's, she's crunched, crunched the numbers. She knows where she needs to be, so she'll need to be on the high end of that range. Um, but I think that is a competitive salary for this position. I, I, wanna, I wanna make that clear. I do searches all over. 
um, I think that is a competitive salary for this, for this position and what all needs to be done here. So those are the terms that I would expect for some conversation to happen. Um, what I need from you is um, a name of a person uh, that we would move forward and a point of contact of who is gonna be involved in the negotiations. So those are the two things that, you know, those are my di directions that I need from the council tonight if you're prepared to make those decisions. Right. I hope that's helpful. <clears throat> so I, um, you know, we, we heard former Commissioner Gross comments on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't necessarily, well, I, I, I think the salary range makes sense for the right person. Right. If you offered somebody that two twenty-five to two fifty, and they're not the right person, then you're overspending. Um, I think if you look at other cities of roughly ten thousand people, that is not the salary range. Mm -hmm. But you look at other cities of similar size. In fact, you can just go down to the cities that are to the north of us, our neighbors. And you look at our budget versus their population, right? So Treasure Island is half our population. Their budget is a third of ours. It's not half. You look at Madeira Beach, same thing. They're about 40% of our size. Their budget isn't 40%. Their budget is like 20% of our size, right? And so it isn't, it isn't necessary because we have a, a different, we have different issues, right, that we're dealing with. That requires, I think, a different level of. I think if we were to hire another manager from a 10,000 population town, we wouldn't have the right person, which is, I think, why you're looking at Kevin. You're saying, oh my God, this guy's got experience way beyond, because those are the problems that we need to deal with, right? And somebody who's maybe at 100, 150 range right now, maybe they're, they're not dealing with the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, and so for me, I don't necessarily have an issue because we have, because we have issues that require a greater level of experience and expertise than would normally be traditional for a town of less than 10,000 people. Yeah, I, I'm, I wasn't thinking going that low, like the, the number you talked about. But um, so have you got an idea, and I know Clearwater is way bigger, city of Clearwater, but have, have you got an idea what some of the ranges are up and down the beach? Um, not necessarily, and I think it's kind of along the lines of what the mayor said. This was an interesting recruitment because I'm not, I wasn't recruiting for 10,000 people, right? I was recruiting for a big city in a small area with a few number of residents, right? So um, I can tell you in Florida in general, um, most uh, larger communities uh, are around 250 as far as their managers. and. Uh, I'm trying to think what um, where Clearwater is, and I only have a frame of reference come, kind of from an assistant level, and it was 200 plus as an assistant. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but no, I, I don't. I don't. I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll, I think we'll need to come up with a price tag that's fair and reasonable, absolutely, you know, for the talent we're looking for. Well, I mean, I guess I'm a little bit in sticker shock here. I mean, admirals and generals don't make that kind of money, and they're in charge of 20,000 people. <laughs> and I'm just like, whoa, and they get all the benefits. We're basically offering up the same benefits that they get, except for health care. But uh, do no, we have a lot of health care is pretty standard. And yeah. Yes. I don't know if you mentioned that, but I did care. not. I did not mention better. No, you didn't. There are standard benefits that people expect, you know, and there, and there are things like health care and life insurance. And um, uh, I have provided your staff, by the way, is excellent. So I can I want to make sure I tell you that mm -hmm. um, they were just exceptional in providing me with uh, an employee manual, with the um, insurance premium, the rates of insurance right now, and a few other things that I sent to candidates early on, or certainly to these five that we were gonna talk with. I wanted them crunching numbers early on. I didn't want us to get to a place where we couldn't come to an agreement, and so, I, and I knew they were gonna do their due diligence, so staff provided me with a lot of information about benefits specifically on the front end that we pushed out um, to them. So they've had a chance to review that. Do we, do we have to answer the number tonight, or is this just us talking? No, I think that's just part of the, the conversation. Okay. Right. It's going to be the based on what the two candidates are asking for, right. but we're talking a less than 10% difference. Right. 
So, so was both candidates, I think you had only mentioned Fran, but what was um, Kevin's? Um, Did he say the same, was in that same range, the 220, 250? Uh, 225 to 250, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, in, in looking at salary analysis, I, I wouldn't compare myself to Madeira, I wouldn't compare myself to Indian Rocks. I mean, those are towns, they're not cities, um, so they're very different. Um, so I try to look for something that looks um, or, or works like St. Pete Beach does, right? Um, Clearwater is not the same, so I wouldn't compare it. Um, but places like, um, I used to live in Siesta Key, so I know Siesta Key very well, and, and I know it looks a lot different now than when I lived there, um, but it's highly residential. They don't have the, the hotels like we have here, though that's, it's going in that direction. But they have a lot of tourism and they have a lot of transient lodging going on over there, um, which makes it very comparable to us um, in the situation. Actually, they're, they're tipping, you know, because they're being hit um, differently, um, not through the hotels, but the, the short-term rentals, um, vacation rentals. Um, do you know what the city manager over there, so like do we know of a city comparable to us what those salary ranges are? I mean, I, you know, there are people in high level positions that don't make this much. Sure. I, I think if I remember, and I can't quote the number, but even the mayor for the city of St. Petersburg, I don't think is, is that high either, and that's a bigger city. Um, you know, it's structured different, so it, right. it is a salaried, right. truly salaried, <laughs> let's just say, compensation. Um, so, and that's what I'm looking for in a salary comparison versus just saying, sure. you know, our neighbor, I know our neighbor can't compare, and the budget is definitely different because the structure is different. Right. You know, if you don't have a lot of people living here or getting a lot of property taxes, then, you know, right. or you have a lot of transient people, let's just say, so we're not counting that population. Sure. You know, so, um, so I, as I, um, mentioned the the range the 225 to 250 was for all of our candidates and so at some level we've done this informal salary survey to say to them where do you want to be or need to be and they basically looked at where they are salary wise and knowing that this was more responsibility or or you know whatever the factors were for them in Fran's case it was you know a, a, a reduction um, and and came up with that um, so in that regard, we've done an informal salary survey, if you will, um, that that's where these candidates are in their career, where they're getting paid where they are, either as an assistant, uh, as some of our candidates were, or, or even some people who are, are not currently employed or they're doing temporary assignments. Um, that's, I, I would say that that is a, um, I, I would say a going range for managers um, in general uh, in Florida and certainly I think that's supported by even where the last manager was that was here. And unfortunately, good or bad, you know, that um, is kind of an indicator to people from the outside of the complexity of the job. And, and if someone was being paid that to do that job, and again, I don't think he had this huge leap into a salary from the prior manager. I, did, I didn't go back that far. Well, I think he started at 175, isn't that correct? Yeah, I think when he left though, I think he was at least mm -hmm. at Maybe well, yeah. there was that, that's years of, and we weren't evaluating, but yes. the base was 175 right. and coming from a large city. So, right. and, and I just like to say that because I, right. I know that people search and look at what the prior right. city manager made. Right. Um, but you, I, I don't the, think you should just be I looking I think that the, the challenge is because we had this conversation with the previous commission because we did have conversations about salary range yeah. mm -hmm. so that we knew what to advertise. And okay. it's kind of tough for us to go back at this point and say, well, I know we advertised 225 to 250. Is that what was advertised? I mean, I don't remember what the exact. Um, we, there was that, a was, that was what was communicated to me. Yeah. I don't advertise the salary Sorry, range. I, I don't yeah. advertise the salary range, but okay. I still need to know behind the but, scenes. But those were, the, talking with those were the conversations. Those are the discussions Renee, I've had. And Correct. Those are the expectations that were right. sort of set. And it'd be right. really right. tough at this point mm -hmm. if we have four people that they yeah. all we're expecting something in that range, which is why we're getting the caliber of individuals that we have. Right. If we didn't have that range, I don't think we'd be getting those five individuals. I think we would have looked at five different individuals. Well, and, uh, you know, and I appreciate that, Mayor, because even though I remember sitting in, in the audience when all that was going on, I didn't remember that detail. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is good to know because, you know, a lot of people also in the public forget that maybe that conversation was already had because um, I definitely didn't remember that. Uh, you know, my frame of mind maybe at that moment was different 
thinking yeah. that why is it so high? Um, but there was, I know there was a lot of thought placed in it. When so you I, I think there's, there's maybe a different way to look at it, <clears throat> to Commissioner Lorenzen's point, because I had sticker shock the first time I found it. So it's, no one should be under the impression that we think, oh, it's just chump change, it's right. nothing. No, it is, it is a lot of money. Um, but I also think that presents an opportunity, right? Because if you're getting paid here, my expectations are gonna be here as well, right? And so if you're gonna get paid like a general, well, I expect you to perform like a general and I expect you to deliver like a general, right? They all talked, you know, they all told us about how great they were and what they're going to do and all these amazing things. And I'm like, you know, you're getting paid top of the scale, then we expect top of the scale performance as well. Uh, I think that that goes hand in hand. I and mean, I would expect that they know that as well, but I also think that we keep that in the back of our mind you know, as we talk about, you know, I think, you know, six month evaluation would be certainly mm -hmm. prudent, you know, on, on in addition to the annual evaluations, just to be able to, um, I forget which one of them said it, is like, you know, we'll always make sure you know when, you know, and so I don't want to wait a year to have, you know, discussion about, okay, we need to see more here, more here, this is great, and we can make some tweaks, or maybe everything's amazing, right? right. But we need to communicate that either way. Absolutely. But I think the expectations should be in line with the with the top of the line salary that they're getting okay. and that's I, just I, base salary right yeah yes. yep. okay and I, I agree with the mayor I think the other thing we need to keep in mind is that um, somebody who is a, a really top performer who is coming in at that level has the ability to save the city so much money in so many ways with increased efficiency and less turnover among staff and you know there's there's dozens of ways where a really high performing city manager, you know, maybe maybe any one of us would look at that and go, man, that's 25, 30, maybe even $40,000 more than we wish we were spending per year on that person. But when you look at the city's budget overall and the ability for a really top level manager to to save you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in increased efficiency, um, you know, I would ex I would expect the the return on investment of getting a really high performer to 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 also be pretty high. It's a good point. Okay, I give. So just a thought, maybe at this point we get to the decision on who's going to be doing the negotiations. So mo uh, well, we need a motion first, and okay. then. Okay. Uh, Do I need to amend my motion? Uh, well, you need to make it from scratch. All right. Because <laughs> it died. Let's see if I got all the points covered here. Um, There's two separate motions. Okay, I'll do the first one first then. I move to select Francis Robastelli for the position of city manager contingent on the background checks and the onboarding uh, requirements for the city of St. Pete Beach. I'll second. Any further discussion? Speak now or forever hold your peace. I, I'm yeah, still like, I, I mean, I look, <laughs> I'll just say, if Fran is selected, I'll be very excited to work with her. Um, but, you know, I, I made it clear with where I stand on it. Um, I think the next few years on St. Pete Beach are probably going to, definitely going to shape the next 30 to 40 years. Um, and I feel most comfortable with Kevin as our city manager out of these candidates for that. And I appreciate that. City Clerk, if you'll please do a roll call. Commissioner Resnicki. Hmm. <laughs> no. Commissioner Lorenzen. Yes. Commissioner Marriott. Yes. Commissioner Filtz. No. Mayor Petrilla. Yes. Motion carries three to two. Thank you. And then the next conversation we need to have is um, having an authorized person to enter into negotiate into negotiate. Jeez. Negotiations. Where's the water? <laughs> Negotiations. Thanks, Brian. With Fran Robustelli. Um, with this one, I would. I think this motion is a good opportunity to include the number two, if negotiations fall through. Okay. This could be a good opportunity to include the number two yes. and, and already give the authority to, to our office to negotiate with number two if, if things agree. happen to fall through. So, Do we have Renee, I know, you, I know you and I have spoken briefly about 
usually what some of the options are, what some other cities usually do in the situation yes. as to who the assigned person is. Yes. Um, you want to? Sure. Um, often it will be either the chair of the board um, or the mayor um, as the point person to be involved in negotiations with the candidate. We are contracted with you to be involved in that if you need our help. Sometimes it's helpful to have a third person involved. Um, and uh, uh, oftentimes it's a, it's a city attorney who's asked to be that point person. Attorney will be involved anyway because they're going to have to draft the contract, right? Um, so it's just really about, I think, who you want to appoint, actually go through the negotiations itself and identify the terms where we want to be on those items that we talked about and, and then, you know, have it put in a contract form to come back to the board for approval at some point. Uh, in other situations, if the city man, if there's a city manager who's still on board, you know, and they're retiring in a month or so, they may be involved in negotiations. Uh, in your case, you have an interim city manager who probably would be willing to do that. Um, I think more times than not, it's the mayor, and then sometimes it's the attorney, and then sometimes the city manager, kind of in that in that order. I mean, it's I I, I personally don't have a problem taking that responsibility. It's not anything I haven't done before, so it's feel comfortable doing it. Um, this is in no way a reflection of the city attorney. <laughs> Um, but they're one of the three chartered officers, and I don't think the three, I don't think the other two chartered officers should be in. Uh, if, if I'm, so are you suggesting that we don't get involved? No, 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 in the negotiation. Obviously, you'll have to draft the contracts and stuff. No, no I'm just saying in, in negotiating the contract of another chartered officer. But you would obviously draft it, you know, based on the terms that are, that are agreed on, terms that would have to be approved by the commission. Would, and Mayor, would you would you be comfortable with, or, or would you would you like to, or not matter to you to have um, to have Wayne as our interim city outgoing city manager involved, just to have somebody who's been through those city manager negotiations a number of times in his career? Would oh, yeah, that be I, helpful to you? Absolutely. I mean, I would I would be relying on on both you know Wayne and and Renee heavily. So, um, okay, good. Yeah, because again with. You know, it's not a situation with Wayne where he, like he's getting kicked out and then, like he's you know <laughs> grumpy and grouchy and he just doesn't you know. No, I, I don't think that's a situation at all. Absolutely not. Um, but I also realize he's got a lot of his plate right now yep. with everything going on. Not that we don't. Um, no, but I would be relying heavily, and he's been a great resource in, in many of these things. Yep. So, um, so just to clarify, you'd be the lead, and you'd have a team with you. Yeah, I would have a team of of two more. I'd like to bring up a point on that with um, with Wayne and something I have talked to him about in, in meetings. My understanding is he is willing to stay on board as a consultant, maybe not being in person here, of course, but um, so I don't know if that would be part of the negotiations. I'd, of course, want the candidate, you know, Fran, to be open to that. So. Um, typically what I see, Commissioner, is that um, in, in the case of Wayne, he would be available um, to communicate with the new city manager. Uh, there's some his, there's historical information that's going to be valuable to the new city manager he, that he can provide, um, and and I think Wayne would be more than happy to do that. Uh, he's been um, you know uh, just a great help throughout even this process with me. Uh, so I don't want to speak for him, but I, I think that would be helpful. I don't think it needs to be part of the negotiations or anything more formal than that. Just um, you know, inquiring if if he would make himself available to fill in the blanks, if you will, if okay. there are some, and there always are some. So I think that would be very helpful to a new city manager. Yeah. Okay. He, he had told me the same thing. We had the same conversation. So just you all know, I was of course. <laughs> For the same reason, because of the history right. and, and things and projects that are you know going on right now that um, we don't want to forget, <laughs> maybe expiring or <laughs> whatever it may be. You know, sure. so I agree. Thank you, mm -hmm. um, Mayor. Just one more thing, real quick, and sure I don't mean to put anybody on the spot. That's not my job. I mentioned earlier that if we did come down to a three-two vote on a candidate, oftentimes uh, I would ask if you would be willing to to give another vote, if you will, and it's more of a vote of support. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about just the hairline differences between these two candidates, and I think it came through loud and clear what kind of support, and, and even Commissioner Fields just said, you know, I fully would support whoever goes forward, but um, I think for the candidate, it means something 
um, to have a 5-0 vote that says we, the five of us, support you. And again, if, if it's not the will of the commission to do that, that's fine. I just wanted to mention it again. Well, I'll leave that open to the two dissenting votes. <laughs> yeah, I will say, it, actually, our, our code requires, I was going to wait, okay. but our, our code requires no, it, I, I at least four. Say. At least four. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I missed that last part. At least four for? Instead of a 3-2 vote to yeah. approve, Fran, moving forward, oh. there has to be four. So if you read the motion, <laughs> you, wanna, you took good information. The motion. So does that cancel out the original vote? Um, no. So the way I was interpreting this motion right now is you're selecting Fran to begin negotiations. Technically, in my opinion, when the contract's in front of you and guys have all agreed to terms is when you will actually appoint her for a term for the city manager. Mm -hmm. So I'm personally okay with 3-2. I'm just letting you know what the code says, which is once you actually select someone, it is four votes minimum. Yeah. Right. Good. So she's been selected. To negotiate. To negotiate. Okay. I yep. see. Yeah, the motion was to enter into negotiation. Right. I see. Do we make the same motion? Is that what, what do we If you, I, this is something that I don't think is legally necessary. I think it's just a request of Renee. Okay. On behalf of the candidate. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah. do we need something formal or can we just say we, we support her? I mean, because I totally can, support her. I'm excited to work with her. You can say you without support Without a doubt, her. yeah. And, and I am too, and I am, I am for making the motion because I do support, like I said, I, okay. it's almost, I, I told you all, <laughs> I wasn't sure if they were ready because they were very, it was very marginal in my mind, you know, so I am okay with doing that. Okay. I guess my, my point I'm trying to get at is, uh, <laughs> I mean, not. Can you erase what you said? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's like, okay. from an outside perspective, I don't want someone to see what the vote was and they, it's, it, it was a 5-0 vote for the candidate. Well, so I, think we, I think we have another vote coming up in a few weeks right. if, okay. if we I get to that, yeah. providing we get to that point. But I think what you've heard loud and clear from the commissioners, even the dissenting voices, and I'll even say this for, for Kevin's sake, this was, it was not a vote against him right. or in any way, I mean, it, it would be ecstatic to have him. But I think we've, we've all, you know, so, Fran will have our 100% support. Yep. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor. Can we please have a motion yes. on? I move to authorize the mayor to negotiate the contract for the new city manager, Fran Robustelli, for city commission consideration and to uh, our, and for Kevin Cowper as our secondary choice. Mm. Okay. <laughs> you you I you wanted it. you asked for the backup. So tell no, us. No, no, I, I know. I just think that uh, I believe Renee's office is going to be involved in potentially weighing. I just think the motion needs some no, no disrespect, some fixing. No. Oh, we, we can just give me, give me say the, the, give me the mayor in cooperation. I move to authorize the mayor, Renee, and the current interim city manager to negotiate with the selected city manager finalists, and if needed the second finalist. Write that out for me. <laughs> got, all right, got that I'd me. like to revise my motion. So <laughs> I get this right. I move to authorize the mayor, the city attorney, Renee. No, the city manager. And the city manager, no, the no, current just, city manager. Not the city attorney. It's fine because we're going to draft the Yeah. Well, okay. It's fine. To, yeah. Uh, to negotiate the contract for the new city manager for city commission consideration and to um, have Kevin Cowper as our secondary choice. Do we have a second? I'll second. City Clerk, if you'll please do a roll call. Vice Mayor Lorenzen? Yes. Commissioner Marriott? Yes. Commissioner Filtz? Yes. Commissioner Resnicki? Yes. Mayor Petrilla? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Renee, is there anything else that we have? We have reached the point of a decision. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, really. I, I'll be working with staff and stuff to move things along and give you updates as we go. It's been a pleasure meeting all of you and doing, doing this process with you. And um, You've been great. You've been really great. And um, I think that's why it was so attractive, honestly, to candidates. They came in, they learned about the city, they met with you, and they felt really good about it. So thank you all very much. We appreciate your efforts. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
All right, unless there's something else, we are adjourned. Excellent.